international conference even in this time of pandemic i heartily welcome our vice chancellor ma'am professor annapurna notyal ma'am our hod professor tc upadhyay sir our coordinator professor sc bhat sir our organizing secretary man dr manish punyal sir dean of school of sciences professor rc dimri sir the convener of this conference professor suresh notyal sir director of usr professor anita rawat ma'am our chairman dr k s bhatwal sir professor rc ramula sir and professor sip krishna ghoshal sir and also i welcome all the invited dignities delegates and my dear friends now we will look forward to get an exposure about what the best of the brains think about this very dynamic issue of material science and its applications now let's move towards today's schedule today we will have our second session and third session for this conference in the second session there will be two keynote address the first one by professor sit krishna ghoshal sir from uti physics from uti physics department malaysia and the second one by professor mahavir singh sir from himachal pradesh university in the third session there will be two invited talk the first one by dr kunjan purohit ma'am av pg college dehradun and the second invited talk by dr deepak joshi sir from iit delhi and also there will be three oral presentation the first one by dr shubhendu shekhar khali physics department pdf fellow iop bhubneshwar second one by dr gorav karnatak soban singh jina university almora uttarakhand the third one by neelam rani from department of physics material science lab chaudhary devi lal university sir Hereby, I will request Dr. K. S. Patwal sir to kindly chair the session. Dr. K. S. Patwal sir. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, first of all, I welcome all for this first session of the day, and uh, this is the real business starting now. And we have two speakers in this session today: uh, Professor Ghoshal and Professor Mahavir Singh. First is Professor Ghoshal. i welcome you sir for this uh, first talk of the day this is the keynote at this two uh a little bit uh, uh, small brief introduction of uh, professor goshal let me say presently he is uh, associate professor of physics at university of technology in malaysia and working since 2010 there uh, professor goshal did his masters from uh, presidency university kolkata and uh, he did his phd in physics from jawaharlal nehru university new delhi he has been teaching for last three decades and uh, apart from the teaching he has been working uh, as a research a researcher in different areas of physics and uh, he has uh, nearly 600 research paper publications international and national and all plus book chapters and books to his credit it is a huge number it is a huge number sir and uh, mostly his uh, research area are advanced optical materials condensed matter physics nano materials and laser physics so these are the vast areas in uh, different uh, uh, different uh, field of uh, physics and particularly when we talk about the material science about this conference so he has all these areas they well fall into the um, this material science the condensed matter physics and the nano materials and all that so may i now request professor uh, goshal to please uh, deliver his talk professor goshal please thanks for your kind introduction and uh, i am grateful to the organizer for this opportunity and i always look for this kind of thing in india wherever they invite i just go ahead because this is really a good contribution to our society and we must do it as indian so thank you so much uh, let me just start uh, and share the screen full screen please okay yeah, i am doing it let me just do it again
either full screen or a bookmark book reading the is second one no, this, this is full screen is it okay no this is uh, not exactly full screen either you go to the book reading mode yeah, that i let know let me, okay let left. me just uh, yeah, yeah yeah right left to that one yeah. left let me just do it one left right this one this one this one click that right yeah yeah usually yeah. this okay it's okay it's okay now okay okay please go ahead thank you so much so i am really uh, it's my pleasure to be here today with so much of uh, high profile people and things it's always a pleasure to interact with different people to get more knowledge so what i have decided to talk on uh, this problem what we have been looking at for last almost 10 years 10 to 12 years is uh, some of the rare earth doped uh, materials of course man made material and how we can use the uh, phenomena of plasmonics uh, into this system to get uh, better uh, devices so we have industrial linkage we have the commercialization in the university so with all this we are basically trying to produce some miniaturized lasers and uh, uh, white led cool white led using some uh, unique materials and one of that material is basically the glass ceramic material doped with uh, metal nanoparticle as well as rare earth material so this work uh, uh, has been done with uh, our ongoing project it's with the taiwa university where i have two phd students and also with utm and uh, this we started four or five years before and the actual project we started about 12 years before uh, and we were the first to uh, start this kind of work in the world and now it's really uh, escalating into a different dimension and that you are going to see as you we go through this lecture so let me tell you what are the main challenges in this field so main challenges is that can we produce rare earth iron doped glass ceramic or glass ceramic materials those are suitable not only for miniaturization of the devices but for making laser display and uh, led application especially cool white led so why we need led because we have semiconductors and so on for example zinc oxide gallium arsenide uh, indium phosphide various other um, uh, wide band gap and intermediate band gap semiconductors are already in the market but there is a problem the problem with this material existing material is that the affordability because those materials are expenses particularly the processing and the purification is very expensive and that's why if you look at the led prices are not getting down that much uh, with last five years then other problem is the affordability availability because these materials are not also plenty on earth so therefore uh, some of the countries who are having in their minerals and rocks or wherever they are the they are making the price high every day as a result we are uh, we are in trouble then reliability of course these semiconducting material devices are having a stability problem and durability problem which are really the major challenge scientists are trying to resolve and then environmental responsibility that means when we manufacture any material we start with any new material whether man-made or natural we have to really look at these four aspects and that's where the application of the material is so in this talk i am basically going to give uh, some idea about the rare earth many people knows it but in different ways but however i am going to highlight their importance and then we'll be talking about how this rare earth material our focus is on holmium 
which is a very good red, blue, and infrared emitter, because nowadays uh, there is a tremendous research on uh, getting the, the infrared, uh, lower infrared and higher infrared laser, because infrared laser and deep UV laser has not been developed yet. In the visible region, we have a lot of lasers, but deep UV laser between 10 to 100 nanometer wavelength, and also the infrared laser between 10,000 to 15,000 nanometer wavelength is a really a big issue now. Then we will be talking about the particular type of host. We are working on zinc sulfur borophosphate glass ceramics. This is not glass, this is not ceramic, this is glass ceramic. That's where the difficulty is how to tune the crystallinity and the amorphicity together to get uh, the light emitting property. Then I will be highlighting what new we achieved and or what we are trying to innovate and some of the results and discussions. I will not go into very deep technicality of the problem because last 15 years we ha I have spent on this. And really uh, we got something like 200 to 300 high class publication, but that's not the end of the story. Every time we do something, it opens some new avenues and that I am going to discuss through the results and some of the interesting discussion, which might be helpful for the newcomers into this field. Let me just quickly remind you, there are 17 rare earth metals make all possible high technology gadgets in our life. For example, we do not have uh, the color mobile phone, color television, any, any devices we talk about today, petroleum industry, uh, then uh, automobile industry, artificial intelligence, any, any sector we touch, not only electronics, with other sectors, wherever this online, for example, camera, devices, servers, everything is basically rely on the rare art material. And one of the interesting thing of this rare art material, uh, the, this was uh, 2010, this uh, report came. Whole world, if we consider the whole world petrol reserve, entire world petrol reserve and the equivalent money, and only the rare art, that reserve in China, that equivalent money is same. So it means that China is occupying 90% of the world reserve of the rare earth. And that's why day by day, this price is increasing. And if we look at few grams of rare earth in 2000, the price was nearly few thousand rupees. Now it is 10 times more than, that means within 10 years, the price has gone 10 to 15 times higher. So this is really a challenge of, uh, in both ways, that how we can minimize the use of rare earth, how we can recycle the rare earth, or how we can properly use the rare earth to get the better action or better effect into the devices. So uh, in short, we do not have any color display with our rare earth. And you can see the gamut of application and gamut of research in this rare earth uh, material uh, when they are put in different kind of uh, other host. Because rare earth itself cannot do, so they need some host like the COVID virus. They cannot do themselves all the, they cannot open up their machinery until it finds a, a host. For example, human is the best host for them to replicate or to whatever, do all kind of nasty job. Same way, the rare earth material needs some kind of host. This host can be glass, this host can be crystal. For example, we know ND Young laser, where, where Young crystal is doped with neodymium, and that gives the ND Young laser. Ruby, for example. So this is the way these rare earth materials are doped into different kinds. Why these rare earth materials are so interesting and so unique? because they have the magnetic, catalytic, and phosphorescent properties, which are completely different from other materials in the periodic table. And they 
form the lanthanide series, where the electronic configuration, they have a xenon core and 4F electron. And as we know in physics or in material science or in chemistry, 4F and 4D electrons, 4 or 5D electrons are the so-called the nasty electrons. They give rise to all kinds of functional material properties, including superconductors and all these kind of stuff. And they are really very, very difficult to understand. And these kind of rare earth material, they have 14 electrons in the, in the 4F cell. And the transition among these cells, among these energy levels, give rise to all such complicated effects. So if you, if we invest our whole lifetime only on rare earth, it will not be enough to understand them. They are very, very interesting material. Why they are interesting? There are reason. So fundamental physics is very important. So they have the center field effect. They have the Coulomb field effect. They have uh, spin orbit interaction, they have also crystal field interaction. So as a result, they show stark level splitting, they show various kind of spectral properties which are quite interesting to understand, which are quite interesting to exploit for practical application. And that's what people in the entire world are trying to do. So when rare earth, as I told you before, that these rare earth materials must be doped inside some kind of host. So what are these hosts? These hosts can be glass, glass, what type of glass? It can be silicate glass, like window glass or the glass. It can be lime glass. It can be like our Sprite or Pepsi or Coca-Cola bottle or paracetamol bottle. It can be yellow right glass, it can be germinate glass, it can be phosphate glass. So human has developed a lot of kind of inorganic and organic glasses. Wherever you dope this rare earth material, this rare earth material shows newer and newer kind of effect, interesting effect, and that people are trying to understand, and we are also trying to understand them. So Japan is called these rare earth as the seeds of technology. So without this, technology is not possible. For example, now you know, in a new series of Toyota Pyrus car, they need five pounds of lanthanides for the hybrid system to run the battery for 10 to 15 years lifetime. So this is very interesting. All the iPhones, all Samsung phone, everything, they have very high amount of rare earth materials used for making the color display and other kind of effect. And U.S. Department in the defense, they use a lot of uh, rare earth material. U.S. Department of Energy, they call them as technology material. So this is the importance of the rare earth material. So why we choose glass ceramic for doping this rare earth material, so-called holmium? There are many reasons. So laser glass is five times cheaper. Of course, I told you affordability is the most important thing okay, in any kind of science. What complex science you do does not matter, but the affordable, when it goes to the common public, when it goes to the common people, they will ask, what is the price? They don't care how the research has taken place, in which laboratory is involved, what is the complexity of the research? They will just ask, if it is the price is okay, we can pay. And also, second question would come, longevity, because if that failures, then they will not, they will not buy that. So longevity is the next issue. Environmental responsibility, of course, for, for the politicians, for the management people, and for the intellectual people, this is important. But for common people, really do not have sense. They just use and throw, like the way plastic. Plastic is so handy, so easy to use. People don't really care about the environment, but we must care as a scientist and as an intellectual or as an educated people. So that's where the environmental responsibility will come. So glass ceramic, we can give any kind of shape, molding. They are transparent. Transparent means maximum light will come out of the material. When anything, when emitter is sitting inside the material, they are stable, they are suitable for lasing. So these are some of the very interesting reasons. And that's why Livermore National Laboratory, American Defense, they are producing this kind of phosphate, telluride glass at large scale for almost all the defense and other display devices 
in the technology. So another reason why we use these glass ceramics, the benefits comes from other reason. They are partial crystalline, so the crystallinity player. Remember one thing, the rare earth will not show any effect. It chooses the particular host and it shows different effect. Why the host is important? Because depending on the symmetry and asymmetry of the local environment, local structure of the host, of the crystal or the ceramic or the glass, the effect of rare earth would be entirely different. That means the light emitting property, the magnetic property, the properties of the rare earth, the stark splitting, all this kind of thing, the until our distortion, all this kind of effect in the rare earth material would be completely different depending on the surrounding surrounding symmetry or asymmetry of the matrix or asymmetry of the network. And that's what it is challenging. That's what the tunability actually comes from there. And material science become harder and harder when we work on them. It's not easy. And that's where the quantum simulations and large scale simulation you need to perform to match the experimental result so that if it can predict something more, it would be beneficial. Then the complex theory comes like Judofer theory, other theories come in the picture to predict the light emitting property or lasing properties or cool white LED properties of this material. So that's the way it goes. So of course, the glass and things are low cost. That is another reason. So they have great optical properties and you can give any kind of shape and also you can make very large seat. That means you can make something like 42 or 64 inch television, or you can put in the entire wall of the skyscraper building so that in the public places, on the roadside or in the corner of the city, people can see. So we have already in New York, in the, in the Broadway, uh, Broadway Road and a Times Square, we have big, big screen in Japan, or if you visit in any countries, those who have visited, you have, you must have seen them. So these large screen can be created by this kind of material. So that's the interesting part. So why we choose holmium suddenly from 70 Dryadat? We have been working on all actually. We have explored something like already 15 kind of Dryadat. But in this lecture, I'm going to only present holmium because we recently noticed that holmium can be a very good agent for green, red, and some infrared emission. That's the So, but with the present holmium only, with the present glass and ceramic, there is a problem. The problem is intense visible emission is okay, but non-radiative transition is too high because if the non-radiative transition is high means phonon will eat the photon. So as a result, phonons are the enemy of the photons. So photons from the material will not come out. How we can eliminate the effects of phonon, which is responsible for the non-radiative uh, radiative decay, that is one of the challenge in these materials. What are the limitations? So limitations is basically the quenching and small emission crosses. So intensity quenches because of the non-radiative transition and also the emission cross-section of the rare earth is already low. And that's what the improvement is needed. How we can improve them? We can put a lot of different kind of metallic nanoparticle, but in the metallic nanoparticle, silver and gold are the best. Silver has the surface, surface plasmon resonance. So when we put this kind of nanoparticle inside the glass ceramic and then bring the rare earth in front of them, interesting thing happens. So plasmon mediated effect happens. So this plasmon mediated effect can push the absorption and emission cross-section of the rare earth very high. So then we are going to see some enhancement or increase in the optical radiative properties. That means the stimulated emission cross-section would be getting enhanced. That means we'll get very high or intense photon emission from the material. And that's where our demand is. That's where the industrial demand is. That's where the application is. That we are basically looking at. What is the speciality of the 
zinc borophosphate glass why not tellurite why not silicate why not germinate why not tungsten it okay every glass is having its own benefit but phosphate glass is already demonstrated by american navy american defense and it is on use in the medical sectors and so on but it is used for the high uv emitting and for also strong visible emission we need for some different other way of land and we also would like to miniaturize those devices i safe emission i safe emission is one of the very important things so that this laser should not damage the eye retina or the cornea so this is basically the idea of the so bore it has high thermal stability low melting point and high transparency that's why we choose bore it phosphate we choose because it has low photon low glass transition temperature and large intake of it can take a lot of rare earth concentrations so zinc we use to stabilize chemically the network or the glass ceramic structure and sulfate we use basically to improve the intake of rare so this is already a nice kitchen chemistry so we cook up all this material to get a good functional material so that's why we call this glass as functional glass because in this functional glass we entirely change the local potential so for this for the glass potential is already corrugated and if you look at the free energy landscape quite complicated that's why the glass is sometimes called super cool liquid or complex fluid even if we put some crystallites into this it become more complex the potential landscape and this potential landscape controlling is really a difficulty and if you look at water corn paper which is called near sightedness effect here we bring such kind of effect in the potential well in the mixture of crystallinity and amorphous and tune the property of light emission and that's where the complex and functional goal of material science starts so what we would like to do so most of the earlier reports or research is going on many are doing it's not we only doing so a lot of groups in the world are doing but most of the people are looking at the optical properties and structural properties we go one step ahead we want to make a correlation we want to determine a correlation between structure and dielectric property because dielectric properties of this material play a very very important role why because polar on bipolar on physics into this kind of material become very important how to control the polar on and bipolar on physics that's another new domain of modern research theoretically people are trying to understand even in superconductor in semiconductor in this kind of material because they have also having a little semiconducting properties so we would like to know them so determining the structural and dielectric correlation dielectric and optical correlation in this material is very important and that's what we look for so here is the complex landscape of our study we prepare some of these kind of glass ceramics then we characterize in all possible ways not only want to character our remember our aim is not just to publish the paper we want to develop a prototype then we go for device manufacturing and if it is successful then the industry can put more money and that we are trying to do so we go through all kind of characterization possible in the laboratory we have something like 20 to 30 different kind of characterization into this material then we have also having a theoretical group simulation group so they also supply some of the simulated lesson data to fit with the model calculation with the experimental result and then we go for something new so here is basically the landscape this is basically the structural network of this material as we thought that we put holmium into the phosphate borophosphate glasses zinc borophosphate glasses then we bring the silver nanoparticles and then see the impact of both into this material and this is the surface plasma resonance ring of the silver and as you can see in this diagram that the emission cross section of rare earth is already very low and how we can increase the emission cross section of rare earth that is the most important challenging aspect into this research so i will not go through the much of the 
uh, much of the uh, literatures and reviews you can see. But what I am trying to tell you, if you look from 2010 to 2021, nearly few thousand classic paper, all high impact Q1 paper. I'm not talking about scoopers. I'm not talking about proceeding. I'm not talking about non-index journal, not Q2, not Q3, only a high impact publication. If you look at American Physical Society, European Physical Society, Elsevier, and so on, you will see this number is quite large. And every time new reports are coming, so this is the indication that this field is opening up and people found some promise into this area of nanoparticle and rare art synergy. I call it synergy. Some of the paper we have written for the rare art and nanoparticle synergy, how it is going to change our future devices. Not only light emitting devices, also self-cleaning glass, for example. Maybe next time I'll give another lecture in the skyscraper building like Burj Khalifa Tower. It is very difficult to clean the window after a dust storm because the, the, those, are, those buildings are in the midst of the desert. So self-cleaning, those cars, expensive cars, every day or every week, celebrity cannot go to clean them. So once you buy the car, maybe in five years, you have to clean once, Rolls-Royce car or Bugatti Veyron car or whatever, the new series of cars. So how to protect them from the dust and so on, those who go for hiking, those who are in the, in the deep ocean taking the pictures, in the National Geographic camera lens, the spec, the player are playing in the field, in the dusty field. So they are Ravon glasses and so on. How to keep them protected from the glass? So again, the silver nanoparticle, titanium nanoparticle plays the role. Those are already in the different areas of functional materials or smart material research that we are already doing. So functional and smart material is another new domain of material science. All right, so what is the, therefore the import, what is the synergy between the nanoparticle and the rare earth? So in one side, holmium is a rare earth, which are having strong absorption cross section or absorption peak in the region of 450, which is visible. And on the other side, you have the silver nanoparticle, which has strong surface plasmon absorption band around 450. That's good news. In fact, nature gives something, but it hides from human something. We human need to explore those things to beat the nature to get those things. And if we can bring the silver nanoparticle in front of the holmium, because of the overlying of the wavelength, it would be possibly a good thing that some of the photons would be absorbed by the rare vice versa. Some of the photon can also be absorbed by the nanoparticle, but the probability of absorbing the photon by holmium from the silver nanoparticle is so high, so we would be in the win-win situation. That exactly going to happen as we see in the next few slides. So if we look at the mechanism of rare earth photon emission, and nanoparticle photon emission synergy and how this nanoparticle is going to feed the rare earth so that rare earth will take more photon from this nanoparticle so there will be more transition when they fall back to the ground state emission will be very high so we are looking for strong emission cross-section or stimulated emission cross-section from the rare earth and that basically the idea that basically the issue we are talking about. So I picturize this in some paper first time. I picturize this effect in the following way. Suppose you are taking the shower near a swimming pool. You, you open the tap before getting into the swimming pool. You want to wash yourself and you open the shower. Now that time, suppose heavy rain starts. So the shower on you without the rainfall is something like laser is falling on the holmium. So holmium is like you and the shower is like laser photon. In any experiment, of course, we have to trigger, we have to induce the transition. 
within the rear art by some kind of laser. So this is the laser pump, which is La Sauer, and U is like the Holmium. Now suppose you are cleaning yourself, suddenly heavy rain started. So definitely this heavy rain would be absorbed by your body. So your body will immediately go more cool and cool because the surface area, each unit surface area without the rain cloud, suppose 50, 50 water droplet was hitting per second from the shower. Now 5,000 would be hitting per unit area on your body skin due to the heavy rain. So therefore, the rain is acting like nanoparticle surface plasmon field on the rare earth. So this is called the synergy. And if we can tune this synergy, if we can control this synergy, how we can control this synergy? We have to choose the right composition of the glass ceramic. Remember, the moment you form the crystal lattice or the amorphous material, they have a lot of bonds. So they have a lot of molecular phonon. This molecular phonon will eat the photon faster than the holmium. So how to tune that complex game? So this molecular phonon is like heavy wind. So at the same time, if heavy wind starts, then most of the rain particles will go away from your body. So instead, your body would be less wet than if the wind was not there. So the windy situation, stormy situation is like the situation of phonons in the solid. So the complex material science is here. Material science is not that easy if you look at, because the potential field in the glass and ceramic in the presence of nanoparticles and so on is very poorly understood because nanoparticle itself is poorly understood. Rare earth also poorly understood. And when you bring glass, crystal, rare art and nanoparticle, which is a very complex business. And that's where we are looking for. Okay, so these are some of the research again on different kind of glasses. But as I told you, because phosphate glasses is more promising for various application reason. So that's why we are working on. So I have many students, something like 30, 40 PhD and postdoc student, various students is working on, some are working on cool white LED, some are working on laser, some are working on display devices, and that's the way a group is working here in the research field. Okay. So what do we do? We therefore synthesize some of the glass ceramic, then we characterize them, then you evaluate their potential for lasing action, but if the lasing action or the light emitting action is very, very promising, then we look for the purity of the color emission. Suppose some material emit the light, but we do not know which purity of the color. So purity of the color is also extremely important from the application point of view, and that's what we are trying to do. So what are the characterization we do on this kind of, we do the absorption, ultraviolet visible near infrared absorption spectroscopy and photoluminescent spectroscopy because this is needed for optical characterization. Then we do impedance spectroscopy for most of the dielectric measurement. Then we measure the density. Of course, density is important to calculate any properties of the material. Then we have to do a lot of structural and morphology characterization such as XRD, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, XPS, Raman spectroscopy, FDIR, Fourier transfer infrared spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy. Then we have to also do TEM, transmission electron microscopy, high resolution transmission electron microscopy, FESCM. So all these things for the morphology characterization. So the complete characterization result of structural, morphological, impedance, or dielectric properties, optical properties, then monochromaticity properties by the CIE, a Clorange diagram, we have to do all this to understand the properties. I'll go quickly go through the technicality of the experiment if some of you are in the audience are interested to come after COVID, maybe 
we can help you to come here to do some research for two three weeks program there are a lot of program indian government like dst and ugc give those money some student has already come here from india so they have spent some time and go so you can also try explore those possibilities and can expose or extend your research if you or even if you want to share your research with us to give us some important and new knowledge you are also most welcome in sabbatical and so on so that's the i purpose of this webinar not just to tell you science what is the future possibility of research collaboration that's also very very important so this is basically the kind of uh, what i would say that uh, all all food all food items in one dish so here i have explained how we start from the raw material then put in the furnace green them melt them weigh them and then in the furnace we put in the porcelain in the platinum in the aluminium crucible to get the kind of material this left hand side is showing the material without rare earth dropping right hand side is showing the material with rare earth dropping that's why the color change and this is the way we get so heating and cooling schedule that means at what temperature we heat shock it then we quickly quench that means very fast we cool down then again slowly heat then anneal then we cool finally to room temperature this temperature schedule is very very important to get the right crystallinity maybe we want 25 percent crystallinity some of you can tell no not 25 18 percent crystallinity rest is amorphousity glass so this tunability of the glass and crystallization requires very complex temperature scheduling which is called cooling heating effect and that we are trying to do so this is the kind of glass we get x here is indicating the concentration of the holmium remember the holmium is the most important guy rare earth which will emit light so our target is on rare earth material holmium then how to tune it rest of the thing will come the structure the composition then how to feed it because its intake is its photon intake is low photon intake means the absorption cross section is low as a result emission cross section is low how to feed it more ah, that's why it will come it's like child a child does not get feeded well by the mother because mother is also working outside so what to do you keep a good maid or bring some relative who can look after the child all the time and feed more so the feed more to the child means growth is more the baby would be healthy so holmium is like an unhealthy baby because its absorption cross section is low how to make it healthy so bring the silver or any kind of metallic nanoparticle who can give a lot of surface plasma and photon into it as a result holmium would be well feeded as a result holmium would be well vomiting vomiting means it would be emitting so absorption and emission cross section would be high so we will achieve the target that we want so we prepare basically three series of material glass ceramic material in this composition borate zinc sulfate and holmium oxide and phosphorus oxide with the right weight 40 30 30 this is called the nominal composition in mole percent doesn't matter so one series is with only holmium second series we choose the optimum concentration then we dope silver chloride silver chloride is cheaper than silver nanoparticle so either we can buy silver chloride or we can buy silver nanoparticle if we put silver chloride heat it in the material then through a process called the coalescence and and rippling it will form the nanoparticle but if we already buy from sigma rich or from company merit high quality silver nanoparticle we can also dope that then we can heat it up so that some of the nanoparticle bigger nanoparticle would be decomposed into smaller so we started with both in one hand we let the system to form the nanoparticle on the other hand we buy the nanoparticle and forcefully dope in the system we wanted to see which produce the better effect that's what the three series of glasses so here are the three series of glasses their properties so you, we have noticed that if this does not contain any rare earth um, contain any nanoparticle only rare earth density increases then the second series 
contains silver nanoparticle then silver nano chloride to silver nanoparticle also decreasing density and again if we put the pure nanoparticle again increasing density so this clearly indicate that the glass ceramic properties are changing whether we are playing with pure nanoparticle or silver chloride so that's the most important thing so how this happens so there are mechanism the mechanism is called the redox reaction reduction oxidation reactions in chemistry basically chlorine has one electron silver is positively charged so this electron is captured by the silver silver form the neutral atom many neutral atoms join together to form the silver cluster and this silver cluster we call nanoparticle but if we start with already pure nanoparticle from the company, again, some of the bigger nanoparticle can form the pure or nanoparticle into smaller sizes. So basically, the idea is to tune the nanoparticle size. That's it. Because the surface plasmon property of nanoparticle is dependent on the size and morphology. If we can tune them by heat and cool control, cooling control, temperature control, we can get whatever we want. So this is the process by which this nanoparticle form called Oswald Rippling and coalescence. This you can do. So how do we know that this is really the ceramic? That means in the background of amorphous, there are crystallites. Something like this. Suppose you are in the middle of the ocean, then you suddenly see there is a small island or there is a big rock like Pathar Charati rock in Kurnakumari. So those rocks are like crystallites in the background of water. So everywhere water, suddenly a small island, Andaman Island, which is something like, or Maldives or Mauritius. So they are something like the crystalline island in the midst of Indian Ocean. So here our Indian Ocean is like glass, Maldives, our the, the other islands and the manicover mauritius these are something like crystallites so that's why the amorphous and crystallite together is called glass ceramic so this we produce so how do we know we look at some of the chunk in the material through the HRTM study. Then we look at their crystalline. This is called lattice fringe profile through the SAED or FFT, inverse Fourier, fast Fourier transform, or you can do SAED, selected angle electron diffraction. From there, you can find the lattice parameter. And this lattice parameter, when you check with the JCPDS card number, then you see this is corresponding to the borate crystals, and that's clearly indicated that we really formed it. So, seeing is believing, so this is the proof that we are working on glass crystal, glass ceramic, not just glass. Well, how do we know nanoparticles are formed? Then we take every glass ceramic from this, then we do TEM and also HRTM, again, measure the SAD fast Fourier transform, then we see again, very nice lattice fringes are formed and that's what we are getting the nanoparticle. So it is ensured that the nanoparticles and crystallites are there. Now we look for the nanoparticles, another proof that the, does this nanoparticle is really emitting the surface plasmon? Yes, we look at the absorption peak and we look at surface plasmon resonant absorption, depending on the size they give two peak. One peak, is around 442, another peak is shifted around 445, 452. So this is like bigger nanoparticles at smaller, smaller wavelength and smaller nanoparticles at larger wavelength. So we are within the 450 regime and we know that rare earth holmium is also having the emission in 450D. That means there is an overlap and that we are going to make a synergy and that's what our interest is. How do we know another proof that this material is glass and crystallite together? That means in the background of the glass, majority is glass, but there are little crystallites in the material. So we have seen that there are sharp peak in the X-ray diffraction. We'll also do Raman. We'll also do XPS to prove further because only one investigation will not be enough because you have to cross correlate. You have to bring other evidences, cross evidences to re-verify, re-affirm that this is really true. 
So these are basically the X-ray data. Then we go to the Raman measurement. In the Raman, we also see the same peak and we confirm that these crystallites have formed. Then we analyze the Raman peak more and more to see where is the phosphate, where is the borate, because borate and phosphate are very interesting material. They can form different kinds of units, PO2, PO3, PO4, similarly borate, BO2, BO3, BO4. But remember, BO4 and PO4, that means phosphate in 4 and boron in 4 are the most stable units. We also want that because I told you stability of the device is an issue. Stability of the white LED and laser is an issue. When you put in the miniaturized toy of children or in the PSM game module, so this laser, miniaturized laser, stability is very important because constant heating would be going on. So in the PlayStation and so on. So that's very, very important. And that's why Raman Spectral give the information about the crystallinity, about those kind of unit stable formation. <laughs> How do we check? We call something called N4 ratio. N4 ratio means to show that PO4 units are more in the system, BO4 units are more in the system than other units. And that clearly indicates that yes, indeed, they are there. So we are making the glass ceramics which are highly stable. So this one issue is solved. The second issue, whether we have formed the right structure or is there any impurity, is there any bad elements in the structure? No. Go for FTIR analysis, look at the uh, spectral uh, weight, and from those weight, we can clearly find the concentration of those units, and then we confirm that they are there in the system. Then we could do the impedance spectroscopy to look at the source of polaron or bipolaron physics. Then we look at the impedance, resistance, and and also the and also the, uh, the dielectric constant, complex dielectric constant, because complex dielectric constant is related to the refractive index of the material. So refractive index we measure, refractive index we uh, calculate from the Lorentz Lorentz and Selmayr formula. Dimitrov Sucker relationship. Then we also calculate the refractive index from the dielectric constant, from the dielectric measurement. We want to match, we want to cross relate, and then compare with the experiment. So, from all such data, we see that they are really correlated. Then we look at the structural symmetry. After looking at the structural dielectric correlation, then we go for the optical studies. Because remember, main aim is to do the optical properties, but optical properties depend on the structural symmetry. So first we look at the absorption in all three series, and we see that as we are doping the nanoparticles in the system, together with the rare earth, the absorption is becoming more cleaner, and the absorption is really getting high, and some of the new absorption peaks, which were weaker without nanoparticle, they become stronger with nanoparticle. So we are therefore in the right track. So from there, we calculate the optical band gap. Optical band gap is extremely important quantity for solar cell, for solar concentrator, for display devices, for many other devices. As you know, the game of semiconductor physics or laser or solid state laser is to do with the disorder which is called r tail, is to do with the band gap energy. Band gap energy is the most important thing. If you have narrow band gap, you have some application. If you have wide band gap, you have some application. If you have intermediate band gap, you have some application. But if you have wide tunability of the band gap, then you have all application. And that's why glass ceramics are interesting because you can tune the band gap over a wide region by controlling the concentration of the nanoparticles and combinations. And you can put two different nanoparticles, three different nanoparticles, two different rare earth, three different rare earth, depending on your aim. So that's the way we are trying to do. So when you put the silver nanoparticle, in the presence of silver nanoparticle, the disorder changes. That's what exactly I was talking about. Local symmetry of system changes. This local symmetry will control the optical properties. And that's where judo field theory comes in. And we also do judo field theory to compare with the result to get them. Then we look for the photoluminescence, which is the emission spectroscopy. And we see intense red and green emissions. So these materials are really suitable for 
red and green laser fabrication and first for the first time i must you can see the literature and check for the first time we saw that we can get very high branching ratio and stimulated emission cross section in this material and that's why our aim is fulfilled so stimulated emission cross section and the branching ratio of this material is very high and that's what we wanted to achieve and this is the right material for making fabricating the laser but the last thing we want to check what is the purity of this color so we have white green because we know in the visible spectrum green green can be several wavelength red can be several wavelength yellow can be several wavelength but which red wavelength which green wavelength that means the monochromaticity and color purity can be only checked by the chromaticity diagram this is called cie chromaticity diagram and this is called the coordinate for the chromaticity when we check we see the color purity for red and green is quite interesting and that's what we wanted and we achieved the target for the time being so what are the novelty of this work the novelty is intense red green pl and also the purity in the color chromaticity and the branching ratio and the stimulated emission cross section is very high for the first time we showed that by tuning the structure and the electric properties you can tune the entire lasing property of the system so in conclusion i would like to say the new series of holmium activated zinc sulfo borophosphate glass ceramic we successfully prepared embedded with silver nanoparticles and structural optical dielectric correlation we have shown for the first time and we demonstrated that this structural correlation is very helpful for making the devices and triggering the other optical properties in the system it is called the synergy and by controlling the synergy of the nanoparticles which is basically synergy means basically the creative combination of this innovative way of combining these different properties to create another new called emerging trends in material science that's why we call these materials as functional material remember these materials is not provided by nature we have to synthesize in the laboratory we have to customize or tailor them and that's the way we can achieve new new devices in the world so the present work is beneficial for the development of efficient photon devices and many other optical devices so what is next this is not the end of the story rather this is the beginning of the story we have achieved maybe one percent 99 percent is remaining so i call it this is the dark area in this science material science is more than the lightened area the lighting area is very small now the research has been started it is in the infancy stage the dark area is more so we have to enter into those gray area and shed some light so that new physics new the new concept is developed new knowledge is generated and that's the purpose of this web near to disseminate the new knowledge that we are trying to understand so evaluation of the gold and titanium nanoparticle combination into this material we have started recently more judofer calculation is required with the magnetic and electric dipole effect that is not quite explored and still today people do not know how to include the nanoparticles effect in the judofer model that is the theoretical model and how to understand that is another then we on this based on this material we are trying to design some prototype so that if the prototype is successful and the covid came in between so as a result most of the supplier are not supplying material everywhere the same problem country like india is better because we have a lot of development and supply but here we mostly depend on the materials from outside world so because of this custom clearance and from taking time so research is little bit delayed because we have to depend on high quality material to get this kind of data so i would like to acknowledge of course utm for providing a lot of grants into this central face we have fantastic facility we call upmu lab in one lab 40 to 60 different kind of 
high quality machines are sitting for characterization. We have wonderful laser laboratories. So ministry is giving money, university is giving money. And of course, our faculty and head department is helping to get the research. And Taiba University is also helping by sending good students to do the research. Of course, I'm grateful to the, uh, to the organizing committee, particularly Manish uh, Upyal, who has taken the initiative and contacted with me constantly. And thanks to you, particularly for your initiative. And you are really contributing together with the university and colleges in uh, Srinagar and Garhwal to disseminate the knowledge. That's where our role should be. We must disseminate the knowledge to the young generation so that the the human dies spirit would work that should be our idea in this side so thank you so much i think i have i have completed in the right time and uh, some more questions or anything uh, would be welcome so thanks to the audience for listening my lecture and spending some time so we are expecting some questions and there is a say the man who asks a question is a fool for a minute the man who does not ask question is a fool for life. So it's your choice to ask or not. With that remark, I end my lecture. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Gosha. And uh, if there is any question from the audience or uh, my colleague sitting there, please. Hello, sir. Yeah, please. Uh, sir, I am Vaibhav Chauhan from IIT BHU. Uh, I yes. wanted to ask that uh, how can we calculate Jude, Ophelt, uh, Ophelt, um, these parameters, these, uh, is there a particular model for calculating? Yes. See, Jude Ophelt is a very celebrated model. Uh, if you ask me how to calculate, I would uh, suggest you, you look at original 1964 Jude Ophelt paper first. And then uh, mm -hmm. in a series of paper, something like in last 10 years, I have published, we have published, uh, my student, about, about 120 Q1 paper only on Jude Ophelt. You can download them and read some of them. In case you face any difficulty, you can write me an email. You can get my email from uh, Dr. Manish and you can send me. I will send you the entire calculation mechanism you do. So I would be very happy to do so. So please do that. Okay, sir. Thank you. Any other please question? From the audience or my colleagues sitting over there? It seems there is no question, but uh, I have a query, uh, uh, Professor Gosha. Uh, yeah, I have been working a little bit on the uh, visible force person. So, in that case, if you want to enhance the persistence, persistence of that particular phosphor, what you used to do, we used to do a code doping in that. Code doping in some cases, um, uh, suppose in your case it is holomium, and then plus RBM, both are three plus three plus. So in that case, we have found that yes, that persistence is goes up and it indicate time goes up. okay but in case of nanoparticles we have not done it is it possible for you to uh, do this nanoparticles as well as the code doping of two ray errors or sometimes two nanoparticles and one ray error something have you tried it or <laughs> yeah so we have uh, uh... We have also published paper only last two years. This is the new, and uh, now uh, we are actually writing three more paper on that. Exactly. Now in one we have put holmium, cerium, and lanthanum. In another we have put holmium, erbium, and atterbium. Another we have put holmium, erbium, and europium with silver, gold. In another we put three nano, three rare earth, two nanoparticle. In one we put two rare earth three nanoparticles. In another, we put three rare earth, two nanoparticles. So these three papers is going to be in the series. And we have found in one of the combination, the chromaticity point exactly reach at the center of white. That means cool white LED is possible. And I hope this would be our first paper. That's very nice. Very very nice. But at the same time, it will be really difficult to know which electron is taking part in that transition from second ray earth or first ray earth or the third ray earth. It will be difficult, though the result will be very good. You will you are, the you, are, oh. you, are, you are absolutely right. Now the question would be, theoretically, as uh, this IIT uh, BHU student was asking here, that 
theoretically how to predict whether it is a single transition or it is the combination of the transition that means whenever there would be single transition you know the line would be broadened how to control the fwhm of this that means as you are saying more sharpness of the line broadening we control more persistent in the phosphorescence we can control that would be another complex calculation or i would say it's not be theoretical calculation maybe some computer simulation unfortunately we do not have much computer simulation for disorder system most of the computer simulation like if you look at our wine 2k or quantum express or whatever they are mostly for the periodic lattice or periodic system so the for disorder system the quantum simulation is not developed yet but yes there would be molecular dynamics or the calculation something like density functional theory calculation or quantum monte carlo to predict all these properties that also some of the students are working here thank you so much for reminding this we will be looking at it more yes you are right. yeah thank you thank so you much that's very nice presentation and very informative also and for our youngsters it is really very good piece of work you have shown thank you so much once again thank you thank you thank you so much for your kind okay now you can just uh, out of this okay fine thank you so uh, manish uh, second speaker hai okay now we have the second speaker uh, things up dr singh has come yes yes morning okay. sir morning. Okay. <laughs> good morning good morning <laughs> so uh, dr singh uh, welcome welcome to this uh, seminar and Thank you. Uh, dr sir mahavir singh is from uh, himachal pradesh university simla and if you remember that uh, 18 20 months back we met in srinagar uh, yeah. yes yes and, uh, that was very good uh, meeting and we right. met only in this seminar only there so he is a professor of physics at uh, himachal pradesh uh, uh, university uh, simla he has done his uh, masters from himachal pradesh university there only and phd from iit delhi he has many recognition to his credit some of them uh, i will list here he has been the vice chancellor for iec himachal pradesh uh, during uh, 2015 to 2018 he has guided successfully more than 20 phd scholars i think so far and he has a good number of publications more than 150 uh, refereed uh, general uh, publications he has so far and he has uh, some book chapters and book uh, also he has published and presently he is uh, working in uh, magnetic materials and multiferrous materials uh, which is very uh, fast growing field in this uh, area and particularly for the medical application these magnetic materials magnetic nanoparticles and nanomaterials are very very important so i request uh, professor mahavir singh to kindly uh, deliver his uh, talk thank you. thank you thank you thank you dr saab thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity first of all uh, thanks to dr manish uh, and uh, uh, dr notial saab and uh, professor bhat professor upadhyay then professor harbola saab for giving me the opportunity uh, uh, we know that we are passing with tough time uh, in the pandemic and uh, my personal uh, salute to all the you know organizer that they have uh, took this challenge uh, this academic uh, you know uh, event uh, so my to uh, you know organizing team uh, today i am going to discuss about as you know uh, when we talk about this uh, covid 19 corona virus so we talk about first wave second wave third wave fourth wave and all so uh, similarly in uh, uh, nanoparticle uh, uh, earlier speaker also talk about uh, uh, various kinds of nanoparticle and i am also going to discuss with magnetic nanoparticle so there we discuss about shape size and surface shape size and surface uh, uh, due to size uh, due to change in size so basically uh, uh, virus also 
चेंज डिफरेंट इन डिफरेंट एनवायरमेंट दैट इज वाई इट्स बिहेवियर इज डिफरेंट समाइम इट इज सिंगल वेरियंट समाइम इट इज डबल वेरियंट समाइम इट इज इवन ट्रिपल वेरियंट सो इट इज बेसिकली समवेयर सो शेप साइज एंड सरफेस मोर्फोलॉजी these three uh, uh, important you know physical property are responsible for uh, you know uh, changing the behavior of this uh, uh, corona virus so uh, i am going to discuss uh, uh, these uh, uh, magnetic nanoparticle the effect of shape the effect of size and effect of uh, you know surface uh, uh, it may be magnetic property it may be electric property it may be other uh, uh, other property also uh, whether it is optical mechanical or other opto electric or opto magnetic other kinds of property but somewhere definitely we can correlate uh, with the health sector as a chairperson already mentioned about the importance of these magnetic nanoparticle in health sector so uh, the topic of my talk today talk is significance of surface size and shape of magnetic nanoparticle for the pre, uh, future application in health communication storage and water purification so all the uh, four uh, uh, factors are important so uh, basically magnetic nanoparticle are unique in the sense its surface to volume ratio is maximum magnetic nanoparticle are unique in the sense they are eco friendly they are biodegradable and they are biocompatible moreover its surface to volume ratio is very very large that is why they are very very effective for health sector for communication sector for storage sector and for water purification so in the present time i think uh, in the material science people are talking about composite system or hybrid system so when we talk about hybrid system in magnetic in magnetic uh, uh, environment so magnetic in magnetic system uh, we talk about hybrid system means at center we have a magnetic system it is coated with some kind of uh, graphene graphene or reduced graphene oxide and it is also somewhere coated with suitable kind of polymer so basically hybrid system is the future material in magnetic sector so hybrid system means one is polymer other is uh, graphene based product and other is good magnetic system so this hybrid system or this hybrid composite system will play the important role in future applications to come whether it is you know rt pcr detection uh, as you know for for covid test we need highly skilled manpower that is why there is some kind of errors also but for you know detection of this rt pcr uh, there are some chances of error also but through magnetic uh, you know this hybrid system we can detect this corona virus and there are few reports uh, as uh, published in nature and other uh, uh, important journals that uh, there are various trials going on so that we can have simple uh, simple kind of testing Uh, as it is already uh, in other uh, uh, detection purposes in health sector so we need uh, at the present time the simple test which can detect corona virus easily effectively and at the same time we do not need any kind of skilled man power simple person can detect also that that is the beauty of this magnetic hybrid system so basically magnetic parameters uh, all these parameters we all are aware of so basically any kinds of magnetic system we have to control whether it is initial permeability saturation magnetization corrosivity electromagnetic medium electro when we talk about electromagnetic medium it is electric as well as magnetic then loss is also important when we want to use magnetic material in communication sector then loss is also very very important so these magnetic parameters are very very useful for designing the or engineering the materials for various kinds of application so uh, this magnetic uh, magnetic system uh, we also talk about one is hard magnetic system and other is soft magnetic system so hard magnetic system means whose corrosivity is large and soft magnetic system means whose corrosivity is low so in some application 
we require soft magnetic system and some application we require hard magnetic system say for example if we want to use in health sector we need soft magnetic system because in soft magnetic system we can achieve super paramagnetism which is a unique kind of phenomena which exists at nano level that is super paramagnetism is very very unique and for if we want to use in any kind of uh, specific application in health sector say for example treatment of cancer or uh, for treatment of targeted drug delivery or for treatment of other kinds of uh, you know uh, genetic kind of uh, genome sequences and all so we need spm kind of magnetic nanoparticle so spm is the prerequisite requirement for to use these magnetic nanoparticle in health sector so we all know that magnetism the cause of magnetism is domain so but that is ma ordinary magnetic material so ordinary magnetic material we say that it is made up of various kinds of domain but when we talk about nanoparticle magnetic nanoparticle then it is not domains we talk about single domain then even we talk further about spm so super para is basically even lower than the single domain so spm is a unique state unique state where uh, uh, basically uh, in the absence of magnetic field there is no you know there is no uh, magnetization but once if there is small fluctuation magnetic impurity it can be it can easily be detected so if we have magnetic nanoparticle which have super paramagnetic kind of character that is very very effective sensor for it can even detect minute magnetic impurity also till date there is no such such kind of sensor in uh, in especially for detection of magnetic impurity or detection of magnetic uh, you know pulse but definitely if we have a magnetic nanoparticle having super paramagnetic kind of uh, no doubt it is challenge it is difficult you know task to achieve this spm even at uh, room temperature so that is difficult but anyhow if you want to use in for uh, hyperthermia application or for targeted drug delivery we have to achieve this so definitely there are few groups on the uh, there are few groups uh, who are uh, fabricating excellent kind of magnetic nanoparticle with uh, you know prominent spm behavior existing even at normal environment definitely i am also working with um, my groups uh, as uh, uh, that is also part of the, uh, this my co uh, uh, co investigator to all this work is uh, manisha patel who is also working on this so basically uh, this spm is the prerequisite requirement for their future application so basically uh, uh, as uh, uh, it is clearly visible that uh, spm is unique rare but it is demand of the time that we have to achieve this at any case so basically uh, then if if we want to use in communication sector then we do not uh, we do not require spm for that we have to use a hard magnetic system so dear friends we have to we have to check whether our application is in the communication sector then we need a hard magnetic system if our application is in the health sector or in st uh, storage sector uh, then we have to uh, we have to uh, uh, work in the soft magnetic system then we have also water treatment for there we have to use at the soft magnetic system so out of the soft magnetic system or hard magnetic system communication require hard magnetic system uh, say for example uh, government of india has uh, received rafael uh, uh, rafael uh, defense uh, I, uh, i think we purchased last year rafael uh, fighter planes so there the communication technology they have used uh, that is basically 
they are using this a hard magnetic system which can work at ultra high frequency region that is around x band or beyond that so uh, so for that we need a hard magnetic system so dear friends magnetic nanoparticle it is of two types one is soft magnetic system and there is hard magnetic system if we if we are in hard magnetic system we do not require super para but if we are in soft magnetic system then we we need a super para because we want to use this as a super specialist kind of sensor which can detect any kind of uh, you know any kind of uh, magnetic magnetic pulse or magnetic impurity so for that it is uh, it is spm but uh, if we want to use in communication then we don't bother about that then we need a hysteresis loop of large uh, uh, large area for the uh, communication purposes so it depends upon the application to application then uh, then if we if we uh, talk about uh, much beyond that then uh, uh, whether it is ferrite system or garnet system or plumbite system so in the present time uh you know most of the research uh, is in magnetic system moving towards very fast in the composite system where people are uh, people are working uh, of uh, kytosan as a polymer in the magnetic system because kytosan is a suitable polymer which is compatible with uh, you know ferrite system then reduced graphene oxide is also very very compatible with the uh, ferrite system soft ferrite system so basically uh, for uh, uh, use of these uh, hybrid composite system of soft ferrite system say for example nickel nickel zinc uh, magnetic nanoparticle coated with coated with uh, uh, kytosan then coated with reduced graphene oxide that is very very useful for uh, uh, whether it is for uh, uh, immobilize immobilization or uh, for uh, uh, treatment of hyperthermia uh, technology for the treatment of cancer or uh, there is also other kinds of soft magnetic system that is lithium base mag, uh, lithium base ferrite that is also very very useful for the health sector uh, for the health sector then in the hard system we have a uh, we have a garnet system or we have a hexa ferrite whose corrosivity is very very large so in hexa ferrite uh, we are also actively working in collaboration with french people and uh, where we are using uh, hard magnetic system from few 100 megahertz to 13.5 gigahertz uh, uh, this machine was purchased in my department last year but as you know due to corona uh, pandemic because of lockdown we are not uh, in a position to you know uh, to operate that machine but definitely we we we, we have purchased that and uh, we we are using uh, hexafluoride of uh, uh, barium based hexafluoride m type hexafluoride or, or cobalt zinc type hexafluoride which are very very useful for uh, ultra high frequency region so basically uh, whether it is in the communication or health sector so it is basically m type or co2 z hexafluoride or in 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 a soft site it is lithium based ferrite or uh, nickel zinc ferrite which i am presently working on and there are results also i think which is uh, already in my slides uh, i think uh, i request please move slides further yeah next 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 yeah so uh, uh, yeah just this is the uh, as i discussed this is the spm so spm is the unique state which i have mentioned next please yeah next so here extreme left it is super para and extreme right it is multi domain so extreme right it is a ordinary magnetic system and extreme left it is spm so dear friends if we want to use any kind of magnetic system 
we have to achieve this spm no doubt it is it is tough task but definitely if if you are good researcher if you are keen in uh, understanding the magnetism definitely you can achieve it next please next so uh, as i mentioned shape is also important that is the beauty of this magnetic system shape is very very important as i mentioned as i mentioned even in corona virus there are reports that it can change its very uh, it change its variant when it enter in different environment say for example i don't know i can't say with but there are reports say for example if if a uh, hot place uh, say for example if you are in up and somebody from up carry corona virus to enter in uttarakhand definitely there will be change in shape size or surface Def because of change in the physical environment condition so that is why because uh, you know that uh, we are in the we are in the midway because there is no clear data that it change different kinds of you know uh, behavior in, when it enter from different region to different region so definitely uh, when we are we can observe in magnetic nanoparticle it change its physical property when we reduce the size we change the shape we change the surface so if magnetic nanoparticle change its behavior when we change its shape surface or size so definitely uh, covid corona virus change its behavior because of definitely shape size or surface so how we can change shape surface or size definitely somewhere physical environment is also responsible in in lab how we can change its uh, uh, say for example size so we can change either by uh, you know by various kinds of solvent by surfactant by you know fuel we we add some time fuel to reduce the size or we can control the temperature pressure uh, i think chair person is the expert on that area so definitely by changing the various kinds of physical parameter so definitely we change the shape surface or size so if we, we if we change accordingly its physical parameter or physical property changes that is why we can somewhere correlate it with covid virus so shape is also very important surface is also very important and size is also very important next please so this is mosbor next please next uh, so uh, basically this is the spm so uh, these are the results as i mentioned about nickel zinc or uh, uh, various kinds of soft magnetic system so these are soft uh, fried uh, results next please so this is basically spm these are uh, this is the exact um, uh, um, uh, morphology of spm so uh, in spm there is no six six line pattern as observed through mosbor uh, uh, so if your system is pure spm then it 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 look like this it has only doublet having some quadrupole moment and uh, having uh, isomer shift uh, that is the clear indication of the existence of spm next please so this is the spm through squid data this is squid data uh, so uh, but this is in the controlled environment it is in the presence of argon and in the presence of vacuum so as i mentioned there are reports also where people have reported that they can observe spm even in the uh, even in ordinary uh, ordinary environment also next please so again this is spm this is uh, magnetic nanopart nanoparticle coated with gold the gold coated nan magnetic nanoparticle uh, having spm and uh, it it can be used for the hyperthermia application and we have used for the treatment of cancer for hyperthermia so, uh, data still is in the uh, clinical trial next please so uh, this is the approach of fabrication so basically this is the uh, thermal decomposition method through which we can uh, fabricate we have fabricated these magnetic nanoparticle next please so uh, this is the approach next next so this is the xrd 
having a, a spinal structure so clear evidence next so this is the exactly just see shape uh, there there is no agglomeration because dear friends if you want to use in health sector your your shape your size and your morphology should be clear there should not be any kind of agglomeration they should be stable they should be stable in aqueous medium and without any agglomeration next please so uh, this is clear squid data we are having clear high blocking temperature which is suitable and uh, close to uh, you know 170 degree celsius next please so this is uh, the theoretical calculation acc ac susceptibility measurement which we have put in uh, theoretical modeling also next please so uh, again this is the gold uh, uh, coated magnetic nanoparticle next so uh, this is the you know uh, hr term next please so this is spm clear this is spm having corrosivity close to zero so as i mention dear friends if you want to use any kind of application we have to achieve the spm but anyhow we have achieved in closed environment that is in the presence of argon and vacuum next please so this is the mosbor uh, so it is a uh, we have uh, the mosbor there is clear indication from six to, uh, six line pattern to doublet means uh, shifting from bulk magnetic nanoparticle to single magnetic nanoparticle or even at spm having doublet next please again spm next next please this is another method that is reverse micelle so earlier method was thermal decomposition this is reverse micelle next please so again there is controlled uh, surface size and shape is controlled so reverse micelle or uh, this reverse micelle is also very very important uh, for if you want to fabricate excellent magnetic nanoparticle but the negative part of this technique is yield is less so if you want uh, if you need a high uh, high yield product then i think you have to choose some other method but if you want low yield product then this method is very very uh, useful where we we can use uh, surfactant so by by adding the surfactant we can control the shape size and morphology and we can easily achieve spm also next please so this is clearly uh, super para kind of behavior there is clear relaxation uh, uh, top one is simple collective magnetic excitation but as we reduce the size then there is change shifting which uh, there is clear transition from bulk magnetic excitation to super paramagnetic transition so there is clear indication from the mosbor spectroscopy and simultaneously we have fitted through distribution function so we fitted with distribution function also uh, so it is cl uh, clearly matches with the uh, xrd dear uh, students also if uh, uh, new student are there research scholar so uh, basically you can correlate magnetic results with xrd in xrd Uh, if uh, if you want to correlate xrd of bulk and xrd of nano so in nano xrd pattern is broad but in bulk xrd pattern is sharp so broadness means surface more uh, surface uh, you know roughness so same is the case in mosbor um, uh, distribution function also uh, we fitted so in bulk we have a broad mosbor peak but in uh, in bulk we have a sharp so broadening means surface disorder so dear friends when we move from bulk to nano so surface disorder increases that is why there is broadening of peak at nano level next please next yeah so there is clearly for, uh, uh, so this is in field data so we have we took the mosbor in the presence of magnetic field at indoor uh, 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 at uh, iuac indoor next please next so this is distribution function next so if this is in field next next so this is all the parameter next next 
next so all these the calculations next 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 but this is interesting at the center this is the core at the surface this is the disorder so we calculate the disorder thickness how much is the disorder at the surface so when we move from bulk to nano how much is the disorder we can calculate through mosbor spectroscopy in field data and we can also calculate by languin function by languin function uh, uh, using squid data so we use squid data uh, to fit languin function then we use the mosbor data for uh, uh, you know cation distribution so we calculate the surface disorder thickness and dear friends uh, there was fair agreement between the thickness absorbed through squid data and the thickness absorbed through mosbor and i want to mention here that our group was the first uh, with uh, iuc people uh, that we calculate the this surface disorder by using mosbor spectroscopy in accordance with the, you know in coherence with the uh, squid data next please so uh, again this is uh, you know uh, uh, squid data next next this is the languin function as i mentioned so we calculate the theoretical calculation also next please so we calculate this languin function next i think you are aware of languin function master degree program students uh, research scholars may be aware of languin function so we fitted the interesting observation from these uh, these uh, curve was Uh, magnetic system it was very well uh, it, there was little bit uh, you know uh, disagreement between theoretical modeling and the experimental calculation next please so again uh, all these uh, there is uh, next please so again this is the uh, you know uh, so this is the basically next please so this is the basically model uh, we apply so we uh, vogel uh, vogel law then neil uh, neil law so we we try to fit it next please so uh, this is the vogel law and we found that in our you know observation it was the vogel law which was very well uh, helpful that is the uh, spin spin glass transition next please so this is the ac susceptibility measurement next so future physics about this magnetism as i mentioned dear friends the uh, dynamic spin spin fluctuation and spin reversal is very very important about these nano particle i think you may be aware of the surface frustration surface frustration means that means spin fluctuation is somewhere responsible for hindering the you know magnetic behavior of these magnetic nano particle so basically core versus surface contribution as i mentioned in hybrid system or in any kind of system one is core and other is surface so surface is surface is coated sometime with cold nano particle silver nano particle with polymer or with reduced graphene so accordingly you can manipulate magnetic nano particle with various kinds of super specialty kinds of techniques by manipulating by engineering with coated techniques different kinds of lithography technique Uh, other uh, uh, related uh, kinds of uh, you know methods so basically uh, future uh, 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 future is uh, in magnetism is about two important area one is the hybrid system as i discuss and other is the core shell so core shell is very very important at the core you have a strong magnetic system but at the shell you have a surface spin frustration so definitely understanding of magnetism at the surface uh, spin understanding spin fluctuation spin uh, frustration uh, the kind of you know physics exist at surface that is very very important so for that we need a theoretical you know theoretical uh, skilled manpower to understand 
the uh, uh, magnetism at surface level next please so gmr effect is also very important so for that this uh, uh, for gmr effect as you know spintronics is the you know core area to so spintronics uh, uh, spintronics is the you know uh, uh, future material or even present few circuits are based upon spintronics so spintronics is also very very interesting uh, field uh, in the future to come next please so basically this is the you know the kind of as i mentioned uh, so earlier results was soft magnetic system and this is the uh, uh, hard magnetic system uh, used for you know as i mentioned in rafael jet fighter uh, this uh, you know communication uh, equipment which is installed on dot that that is uh, you know french base so basically they are using hard magnetic system for it so this is also the area which is very very useful for you know communication uh, area next please so we are also working on this so these are the results uh, the, the, so at the bottom it is the imaginary part and the, uh, on the top it is the real part dear friends one thing is very very important if you want to use any kinds of hard magnetic system in communication interesting part is your real permittivity and permeability should be high that should be greater than 2 but imaginary that is imaginary or loss that should be close to zero but in our struggle we have controlled electric part permittivity we are okay our permittivity imaginary part is zero and real part is greater than 2 but permeability we are still struggling we can't control we are not able to control the imaginary part of permeability still we are struggling there but anyhow we have purchased this machine so definitely uh, uh, in times to come uh, we will definitely control the permeability also close to zero so this is also interesting area next please again the, as i mentioned so we are still struggling with the permeability next please so this is the hyperthermia study which we have used so we fabricate the iron based nanoparticle coated with gold or so we uh, we we have used this for hyperthermia and uh, where we found that it can be it can be very very useful for the treatment of cancer cell but as i mentioned cancer cell is not specific it is of different kinds so uh, this kinds of study is for limited kind of cancer cell but still other kinds of cancer cell still there are clinical trials going on in magnetic nanoparticles also next please so uh, with these words i think this is new uh, this is the other part of my talk but i think uh, i leave here with the remarks that with the remarks that uh, as i uh, my today's talk was uh, uh, i want to brief it in the way that if you are working in the material science or we you are working in the nano material or you are working in the magnetic nano material so at the present time uh, the, uh, this is lesson to all of us because of this covid pandemic so i think uh, we have to we have to work in the front uh, front area where we can fabricate you know various kinds of nano particle so that it can be useful for various kinds of application so my uh, my message to new researcher is please uh, uh, fabricate excellent kinds of nano particle so that it can be useful for you know specific application so with these words i uh, i am thankful to all the you know all the uh, 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 all the participants all the organizer for listening my talk and thanks once again my friends and my respected chairperson for uh, and the organizer for giving me the opportunity and i want to mention one thing uh, manish is aware of that chairperson i want to especially mention before you sir i was day before yesterday at, at haridwar because during this time actually 10 days before i lost my brother who was uh, for me like father so i reached yesterday evening at, at my village i am right now in village 
तो बट एज यू नो आई कैन अंडरस्टैंड Uh, it is all our joint responsibility that we have to do our karma whether it is academic karma or domestic karma we have to perform our duty so with these words i stop my talk here thank you very much once again for listening my talk thank you thank you professor singh and i'm very sorry to listen to that that your brother sir. no more uh, sir may hello uh, sir hello sir hello sir hello sir, hello, sir. thank you for your very nice talk i have one, one doubt sir oh yes, please, please listen please listen i'll come to you sir, come sir to you. what is the effect of external parameters like temperature on men who is speaking please please tell your name first hello men who is asking the question please yes you tell him please tell your name Hello. Is muted now. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Professor Singh. It was really, yes. really nice to listen to you, and uh, but uh, really sorry to listen that that your brother is no more. Fine. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yes. Okay, please Hello. tell your name, sir. Myself, I... Ninga Pahote. Okay. Uh, sir, I have one more doubt, sir. Okay, okay. Yes, ask, right. ask, ask. Sir, sir what is the effect of external parameters like temperature on magnetic properties of material at nano scale oh yes yes this is good question i uh, through you know changing the temperature you can control the you know uh, you can control the size surface you can definitely hmm. control hmm. Uh, sir, sir, uh, sir can you explain in detail So, how, 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 how can it be, can be controlled yeah by, by controlling yeah as as you know this this sir saturation magnetization it, it is it is dependent on you know basically the size of the nanoparticle mm -hmm. through changing the size of the nanoparticle you can change the saturation magnetization so saturation magnetization you can control with temperature at high temperature saturation sometime increases but at some temperature it decreases so it is basically optimization you have to optimize the temperature through temperature dear you control the saturation magnetization through controlling the saturation magnetization you control the size right okay thank okay. you sir. thank okay. you sir. any other question please kahi aur se koi question hai hamare logo se hello yeah, yes yes hello uh, good afternoon sir this is pooja rawat from department of physics hnb gadwal university yes 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 ha yeah. pooja ji boliye uh, yes sir thank you for the informative talk yes, sir i would you, like to, i would like to ask uh, how does uh, the broadening of peaks occur in a uh, case of nanoparticles in xrd oh as i mentioned it is the surface disorder it is the surface disorder it is the as you know if surface surface is more than volume it is the broadening it is basically surface disorder okay sir in 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 bulk surface disorder is less that is why peak is sharp okay thank you sir okay another question please aur koi lagi sahab lag sahab with the end uh, uh, my uh, your your visit to shimla is due but as my as, uh, as well due, our yes. my promise was with you at shrinagar but as you know after some time we are passing with the covid yes so that's what happened na we met in uh, november 18 i think na november yeah, 19 yeah. Now my yeah, yeah. and then after two three months it was a lockdown yeah, and my visit is still yes, pending. Yeah, yes, it, it will be pending. privilege. It will be privilege for me to invite you in that department. But certainly, yeah. certainly I'll visit once this uh, Corona thing yes. goes. I'll yes. certainly yes. visit Singla sir. Yes. Anna, yes. I'm going to do down the Singla. Okay, one one query thi meri. Ah, ha. One query kya hai? Ye suppose apke paas jo magnetic domains hai, if they align somehow, you are not knowing them. You are not trying to align them, but somehow they get aligned. आपके yeah. temperature से या कुछ है ना suppose they get I aligned, mean. then in that case it will behave like a single domain. Yeah. है ना 
तो फिर आपका जो ये मैग्नेटिक उसका कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स है वो तो चेंज हो जाएगा ड्रास्टिक चेंज हो जाएगा तो कैसे पता करेंगे आप किसके अलाइनमेंट नहीं हुआ है आप नहीं चाहते कि अलाइन हो पर समाव अगर ये हो गया अलाइन हो गए तो कैसे पता करें आप साहब उसके लिए ना हाँ यस यू कैन टेस्ट इट बाय मैग्नेटिक पोलिंग एक टेक्निक होती सर मैग्नेटिक पोलिंग आप एक्सटर्नल मैग्नेटिक फील्ड करके उसको अलाइन कर सकते हैं उससे आप ऑप्टिमाइज कर सकते हैं कि व्हाट इज द इफेक्ट ऑफ अलाइनमेंट वो तो आपने किया लेकिन आपका तो दैट इज वाई डॉक्टर साहब ये जो एस पी एम है दैट इज वाई आई मैं अगेन एंड दिस इज वेरी यूनिक और ये इतनी यूनिक है सर कि एबसेंस में एबसेंस में ये कुछ नहीं शो करता ये इतनी यूनिक स्टेट है एबसेंस में जीरो है जैसे इवन माइन्यूट इवन फ्लक्चुएशन होगी मैग्नेटिक ये इमीजिएटली सेंस कर लेता है और मैं इसका एग्जाम्पल देता हूँ डॉक्टर साहब आपने अच्छा रेज किया हमारा जो ब्लड है हमारा जो खून है इट इज ऑल्सो मैग्नेटिक बट इट्सिटी इज वेरी वेरी स्मॉल सो सो इफ यू वॉन्ट टू सेंस मैग्नेटिज्म ऑफ ब्लड यू नीड दैट काइंड जो आपने पॉइंट आउट किया वो अलाइनमेंट आपको सुप्रीम बनानी पड़ेगी तब आप उसको सेंस करते हैं वो कंट्रोल में होना चाहिए आपके हाँ यस अलाइनमेंट टू बी योर हैंड योर कंट्रोल नहीं तो फिर तो सब जो बना वो पता ही नहीं चला क्या बना यस सर बिल्कुल डेफिनेटली एक मैं जरा कोविड नाइन्टीन पे थोड़ा सा फंडा क्लियर करो हाँ जी अभी आपने बोला था कि ये उत्तर प्रदेश से आया उत्तराखंड में जाकर के उसका जो है हाँ, 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 हो गया मैं, मैं आपको एक्सपीरियंस मेरा यहाँ एक्सपीरियंस है पहले मुझे सुनिए पहले मुझे सुनिए है ना हाँ जी हमें बताओ ये कोविड नाइन्टीन जो वायरस है ये आर एन ए बेस्ड है बेसिकली हमारे पास होता है डीएनए और आर एन ए दो मोलिक्यूल्स है हमारे पास होते हैं इसी पे लाइफ चलती है ना दिस इज नॉट डीएनए बेस्ड वायरस ये जो है आर एन ए बेस्ड है और आरएनए बेस्ड सिंगल सेल होता है आप भी जानते हैं मैं भी जानता सभी जानते हैं डीएनए जो है मल्टीपल सेल होता है अच्छा और आरएनए सिंगल सेल होने की वजह से जैसे अमीबा पढ़ते थे ना हम हाई स्कूल बायोलॉजी है ना सिंगल सेल तो उसकी क्या क्वालिटी होती है वो अपने को सेफ चेंज करता है जिसको आर्टल वेरियंट बोल रहे हैं है ना ठीक है सेफ चेंज इसलिए करता है दैट इज ओपन स्ट्रक्चर बेसिकली बींग सिंगल सेल सिंगल सेल होने की वजह से ओपन स्ट्रक्चर है तो ये चेंज करता से ये उसकी अपनी कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स है जबकि जबकि डीएनए सेफ नहीं चेंज करता है डीएनए जब तक आप उसको कुछ डालेंगे नहीं तब तक सेफ चेंज नहीं करेगा तो डीएनए जितने भी वायरसेस हैं वो कभी सेफ चेंज नहीं करते उसमें वेरियंट नहीं आते लेकिन आर एन ए बेस्ड कोविड नाइन्टीन आर एन ए बेस्ड है इसलिए सेफ चेंज होता है जिसको वेरियंट चेंज होता है क्योंकि इसके ओपनिंग है अब प्रॉब्लम कहाँ है प्रॉब्लम ये है कि वो चेंज अपने आप होता है जोग्राफिकल लोकेशन और देश और कलर और उसमें नहीं होता है ये उत्तराखंड और यूटी का मामला नहीं है ये अच्छा जो आजकल बोलते हैं ना कि हम कि इंडियन वेरिएंट है या अफ्रीकन वेरिएंट है दैट इज ऑल्सो वेरी रॉन्ग कॉन्सेप्ट ये कोई भी ऐसा नहीं हो सकता इंडियन वेरिएंट है इंडिया में मिला तो इंडिया में दस मिल गए आजकल हाँ जी हाँ जी इंडिया में बीस मिल गए या पांच मिल गए या दो मिल गए इट इज पॉसिबल विद ओनली विद दैट आर इन ए सेल क्योंकि ये उसकी कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स है हाँ इसका एक फायदा क्या था आरएनए होने की वजह से सिंगल सेल होने की वजह से इसके वैक्सीन दस महीने में निकल गई अगर ये डीएनए बेस्ड होता हो सकता है वैक्सीन आने में शायद दो साल लगता राइट आरएनए बेस्ड होने से एक फायदा तो ये हुआ कि हमें वैक्सीन जल्दी मिल गई रिसर्च जल्दी हो गई नुकसान ये हुआ कि वी हैव मल्टीपल वेरियंट लेकिन चूंकि वो बेस्ट सेल एक ही है फायदा क्या है कि जो वैक्सीन अभी हमने चाहे कोवैक्सीन है चाहे कोवासिल्ड है चाहे कोई और वैक्सीन है इट विल वर्क फॉर ऑल द वेरियंट बिकॉज द मेन जो सेल है वो एक ही है तो ये प्लस पॉइंट बताना चाहता हूँ मुझे नहीं था सर ये तो दिस वॉज माई अजम्पन एक्चुअली नहीं बोला तो मैं चुप मार रहा था आपने उत्तराखंड बोला एक्चुअली एक्चुअली इन शिमला में हमने देखा सर एक वो बाहर से जो आने के बाद स्प्रेड एकदम हुआ और जो लोकल में बट आई आई सुजेस्ट यू सर डॉक्टर साहब आप मैं आपको सुजेस्ट दूंगा कि आप अपना ये कोविड के ऊपर थोड़ा सा क्योंकि आपका आर एन एस का इतना एक्सपीरियंस है मैंने लिबर्टी ली यहाँ पे मेरे सभी लोग अपने घर के हैं तो मैंने लिबर्टी ली बोलने की अदरवाइज आई एम नॉट बायोलॉजिस्ट मैं तो भाई फिजिक्स वाला आदमी हूँ बायोलॉजिस्ट तो हूँ नहीं पर फिर भी जो मैंने इन्फॉर्मेशन आप लोगों को दी इट इज हंड्रेड एंड वन परसेंट करेक्ट ये कारण ये है और इसीलिए हम सक्सेसफुल भी हुए इसके वैक्सीन लेने में 
आने में आप देखे नहीं हमारे बाकी जैसे उसका कई सारे और जो वैक्सीन थे उसको आने में दो दो तीन तीन चार चार साल लग गए थे वैक्सीन आने में बहुत टाइम लगता है इसमें दस महीने में वैक्सीन मार्केट में आ गई फ्लेक्सिबिलिटी थी यू कैन वर्क आप उसे काम कर सकते थे डीएनए में बहुत मुश्किल होता है इट इज टोटल क्लोज सिस्टम डीएनए जो है क्लोज सिस्टम है तो प्रकृति ने हमको प्लस पॉइंट भी दिया नेगेटिव पॉइंट भी दिया किसी थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू ये बताइए आप आप अभी बैठे कहा है उत्तराखंड में कि आप अभी इंदौर में ही मैं पिछले डेढ़ साल से इंदौर में फंसा हुआ हूँ चलो ठीक है सर थैंक यू डॉक्टर साहब टेक केयर टेक केयर डॉक्टर साहब टेक केयर आप लोगों का सबकी दुआ रहेगी सब ठीक रहेगा थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच फॉर योर टॉक थैंक यू थैंक यू मनीष नाउ यू कैन टेक ओवर थैंक यू सो मच सर फॉर शेयरिंग योर रिसर्च वर्क विद अस and this information is going to be really helpful to cope up with the current situation of covid crisis now hereby we will start our third session and for this i will request professor rc ramola sir and professor sir krishna ghoshal sir to please share the session thank you sir uh thank you pooja and uh, a very good morning to all of you i think this uh, is so morning in this regard i have an information uh professor ship uh, krishna ghoshal have an important meeting uh, with the vice chancellor in their university for the continuous increasing cases of covid so he apologize me to chair the session with uh, ramula sir so ramula uh, sir uh, you please chair the uh, whole session uh, okay it's not a problem for this information but uh, i would like to welcome all of you of course certainly because uh, professor ghoshal was Also a co-chair of this session, so on behalf of me and uh, Professor Gosal, I would like to welcome you all to this third technical session of this seminar. And uh, in the morning, you had two very informative keynote address. I will say very informative keynote address from uh, Professor Gosal and then uh, from Professor Mahavir Singh. And now we are coming to the third session with uh, two invited talks and three. contributed talks and uh, i would like to share here that uh, the invited talk is of 30 minutes so i would like to request all speakers to keep the time or keep their talk within 25 minutes so that we can have 5 minutes for the discussion and the contributed talk are of 10 minutes so we'll divide it at 8 plus 2 8 minutes for the presentation and 2 minutes for the discussion or to answer any questions so with this information i would like to start with the first invited talk which is by dr gunjan prohit but before proceeding uh, i would like to give you the brief bio data of uh, dr prohit dr prohit in fact is the alumni of your our university and he is currently working at the dav college dehradun as an associate professor and dr prohit did his msc from garhwal university in 1996 and then after phd from the same university in 2001 then he moved to uh, iit new delhi as a post doctor fellow and remains there from february 2001 to december 2002 and then he joined as a scientist in mnre research project and he was there from 2003 to 2005 and he is also the recipient of the young scientist fellowship from department of science and technology new delhi in 2005 the field of his interest is laser plasma interaction and he is doing r and d work for last 20 years in the field of uh, very high laser power flux and uh, his current research interest includes high power laser plasma interaction laser driven particle acceleration acceleration and strong that terahertz radiation driven by higher intensity lasers he has published more than 72 research papers in the journals of international report and edited two books he was a recipient of young scientist award of the uttarakhand council of science and technology in 2007 and 2008 he is a life member of plasma society of india optical society of india and in an association of physics teachers 
he is a he is the reviewer of various journals international journals and has successful, successfully completed several research projects funded by dst csir u cost and ugc and uh, at the end i will say that he has also worked as a co investigator in uae sponsored research project at al ain university uae during 2015 and 2017 so with this brief introduction i would like to invite dr prohit to deliver his talk on the topic laser driven plasma based particle accelerators so dr prohit now the dice is yours and before uh, that i would like to say that this is a virtual platform and uh, there are is always possibility of some technical glitch in between so in case if we feel any technical problem in uh, in between these uh, talks or in in the session so i hope that you will bear with us so now i request dr prohit to continue his talk or to start his talk sorry hello i am yeah. audible yeah you are audible please and uh, my screen is visible sir yes it is visible only thing is you have to make it uh, full screen, full screen mode okay sir okay yeah presentation mode you open the powerpoint now yes. make it presentation yes sir that control plus and is also working if yeah, this is your first page is okay no you changed it now Yes, so use control F five F five to go to slide share mode sir F five F five also. Cancel, cancel it. Your upside is slide show, na? That is also. गुंजन आपके स्क्रीन पे ही है फुल फुल स्क्रीन या बुक मोड या तो बुक मोड में दबा दीजिए या ओके 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 नाउ प्लीज अनम्यूट योरसेल्फ first of all i am thankful to the organizer of the conference for giving me the opportunity to present the talk i am going to switch up my video due to weak network if any problem is there okay <clears throat> sir please wait for 1 minute okay as you can see 
the title of my presentation is laser driven plasma based particle accelerators basically plasma accelerators are considered to be one of the most complex scientific machines built by mankind initially particle accelerators were constructed for studies in nuclear and particle physics and today they find application in wide ranging areas for example synchrotron radiation sources emitting narrow beam of electromagnetic radiation ranging from far infrared to x rays is an important tool for researcher in physics chemistry biology and even in industry similarly low energy accelerators have application in industry and medicine for example in the treatment of cancer preservation of food and agriculture products so this talk will be mainly focus on plasma based laser driven uh, uh, particle accelerators and this slide shows the outline of the uh, presentation outline outline of the talk first i will start with particle accelerator where i will discuss how the particle accelerator works after that i will come on plasma based particle acceleration here i will discuss on laser plasma accelerators laser plasma accelerators scheme status and prospects of laser plasma accelerators and finally the talk will be concluded accelerator science accelerator science has been major breakthroughs over recent years which is driving an increase in demand for state of art particle accelerators with applications across many different field of science accelerator technology is a billion dollar industry with more than 30000 particle accelerators currently in operation worldwide serving medicine industry energy and discovery science accelerators are used for medicinal diagnosis diagnostics cancer treatment semiconductor research metal development and particle physics this is large hadron collider at cern is at the forefront of particle physics research and these are the uh, uh, some equipment which are based on particle accelerators one is x-ray technologies make possible accelerators such as the mri machine and portable x-ray for non destructive testing about particle accelerators particle accelerators are essential tools of discovery for particle and nuclear physics and for science that is x-rays and neutrons a particle accelerator is a machine that accelerates elementary particles such as electrons or protons to very high energies on a basic level particle accelerator produces beams of charged particles that can be used for a variety of research purposes and mainly there are two type of particle accelerators one is linear accelerator and other is circular accelerator linear accelerator propel particles along a linear or straight beam line in circular accelerator propel particles around a circular track linear accelerators are used for fixed target experiments where circular accelerators can be used for both colliding beam and fixed target experiments in a little bit i will discuss how the particle accelerator works mainly there are six component working on particle accelerators the first is particle source the second is beam pipe here the third is electromagnetics Fourth is electric fields, fifth is targets, and sixth is detectors. So particle accelerators use electric fields to speed up and increase the energy of a beam of particles, which are stirred and focused by magnetic field. The particle source, this one, provides the particles such as electrons or protons that are to be accelerated. The beam of particles travel. along a the beam of particles that was inside a vacuum in metal and metal beam pipe the vacuum is crucial to maintaining an air and dust free environment for the beam of particles to travel on a straight rate and electromagnetic electromagnet stir and focus the beam of particles where it where it, uh, it travels uh, through the vacuum tube electric field is spaced this one electric field is spaced the accelerator switch from positive to negative at a given frequency creating radio waves that accelerate particles in bunches 
Particles can be directed at a fixed target, such as a thin piece of metal foil or two beams of particles can be collided. Particle detects are recalled and reveals the particles and radiation that are produced by the collision between a beam of particles. Okay. Why particle accelerators matter? This is because particle, uh, you know, particle accelerators are useful in many applications from discovery science to security. Particle accelerators are, accelerators are essential tools of discovery from part, for particle and nuclear physics and for science that use accelerators and neutrons. In medicine, tens of millions of patients receive accelerator-based diagnosis and therapy each year in hospital and clinics around the world. In industry, worldwide, hundreds of industrial processes use particle accelerators from the manufacturing of computer chips to the cross-linking of plastic for shrink wrap and beyond. In security, particle accelerators play an important role in national security, including cargo inspection, uh, stock file, uh, uh, starboard ship and metal characterization. Current particle accelerators, current accelerators use radio frequency cavity to accelerate charged particles to the speed of light. These cavities are metallic chambers that contain an alternating electric field which kicks the incoming particle to accelerate them. In the case of large hydrogen collider, there is RF cavity used to accelerate electrons and keep them in the control branches. And the electric field with, within this cavity is limited to less than 1000 megavolt per centimeter and their metal walls tend to break down if higher electric fields are attained. To overcome this issue, RF cavity must be built in sequence. This increases the length of the accelerator and can be many kilometers long. For example, the length of large hydrogen collider is 27 kilometers long, which is underground. underground and uh, which is uh, situated in Virginia, Switzerland. And for accelerators to be more accessible for using industry and medicine, we need to reduce their size and cost. The solution is plasma accelerators. Plasma is the fourth state of matter. It is an electrically conducting medium with positively and negatively charged particles created by applying high energy to a gas. Here you can see that plasma cells are gaining much attention in physics research. Plasma medium has heavy ions and free electrons. Our sun is also a plasma star. And when the plasma is subjected to a laser, particle beams charge and a strong electric field is formed. And this principle can be applied to plasma accelerators. Why and what is plasma based acceleration? So I already told, told that plasma is an attractive medium for particle acceleration and plasma-based accelerators are of great interest because of their ability to sustain extremely large acceleration gradient. Plasma-based accelerators are important because they can accelerate particles to high energy in distance a thousand times shorter than conventional radio frequency accelerators. And the rapid develop, development or rapid progress in the development of high intensity laser system has extended our ability to study light matter interactions far into relativistic domain in which electrons are driven to velocity close to the speed of the light. Laser plasma accelerators are capable of accelerating charged particles to very high energy in very compact spectres. For the first time, it was realized by Thesma and Dawson that as laser beam propagating in a plasma can excite electron plasma wave, which being longitudinal and can be used to accelerate electrons. And these accelerators utilize a relativistic plasma wave with a phase velocity close to the speed of light for charged particle acceleration to high energies. In laser plasma electron accelerators, a longitudinal accelerating electric field is generated by the ponderative force of an ultra short and ultra intense laser. And this force, proportional to the gradient of the laser intensity, pushes the plasma electrons out of the laser beam path, separating them from the ions. This creates a traveling longitudinal electric field in the wake of the laser beam with a phase velocity close to the speed of the light, most suitable for accelerating particles to relativistic energies. And this electric field can reach amplitude of several hundred gigawatt per meter. The longitudinal electric field of the plasma wave is higher than 100 gigawatt per meter, which is a thousand times higher than, higher than that of the present radio frequency accelerator. Gradient form 
वन गीजा इलेक्ट्रॉन बोल्ट पर मीटर टू हंड्रेड टेरा इलेक्ट्रॉन बोल्ट पर मीटर आर पॉसिबल फ्रॉम रिलेटिविस्टिक प्लाज्मा वेब्स दस प्लाज्मा बेस्ट प्लाज्मा पार्टिकल एक्सीटर्स ओपन द न्यू एंड एक्साइटिंग फील्ड ऑफ एक्सट्रीम ग्रेडियंट Why do we want to use a laser plasma accelerator? This is very important thing. And we, as you know that conventional particle accelerators are, accelerators are large and ex expensive machines. Conventional accelerators cannot achieve better than few ten mega volt per meter, or you get breakdown. Plasma based accelerators are are a possible compact alternative. Here you can see that a section of RF cavity of one meter on produce only. 40 mega volt per meter acceleration gradient acceleration gradient whereas in the case in the case of plasma based accelerators the size of excited relativistic plasma wave is only 50 mm which produce 100 gigawatt per uh, per meter acceleration acceleration gradient in particular we are now quite good at accelerating excellent uh, electrons to approximately 1 giga electron electron volt with Approximately how hundred terawatt lasers. There are some important points associated with uh, laser-driven plasma-based particle accelerators that uh, high electron density rates have electron accelerating gradient. I mean the accelerating gradient of accelerator depends upon the density of the plasma. Ultra high gradient requires structure to sustain high fields. For example, in the case of dielectric structure. Where high breakdown occurs, only one giga volt per meter acceleration gradient is achieved. In the case of plasma, which is already in breakdown, approximately ten giga volt per meter acceleration gradient acceleration gradient is achieved. High gradient require high peak power, which can be driven by laser or particle beam. There has been a strong advance accelerator R and D efforts worldwide. For the last 20 plus years, exploring this concept, and critical development is that plasma-based acceleration and development of laser technology for high field power delivery. And uh, this uh, slide illustrates the critical needs and product of plasma accelerator research, all supported by the fundamental science of relativistic plasma physics, including the nonlinear optics of relativistic plasma. The diagram illustrated that plasma accelerator requires advance in driver technology, target design, and diagnostics to make progress, and simulation tool to both understand and design accelerator schemes. The arrows going with include indicate that plasma accelerator research has feeds back into shaping and development of diverse targets and diagnostics. Product include technological applications such as new imaging techniques, tools for scientific discovery such as ultra-fast X-ray sources or extremely high-energy lepton, and student training for workforce development in academia and industry. I already discussed about this. So, uh, drivers for uh, plasma-based accelerators. There are many two types of drivers using in uh, plasma-based accelerators. One is lasers, which is uh, coming in size uh, and peak power, terawatt, uh, terawatt, petawatt compact lasers, 10 to the power 12 to 10 to the power 15 watts already exist. Some with very high uh, repetition rates, uh, 10 hertz, capable of 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the power 21 watts per centimeter on targets, square on targets. And future is that 10 to the power 23 watts per centimeter square using optical parametric chipped uh, pulse amplification technique. The second driver driving source is electron beams. Saved electron beams such as the pro, um, uh, proposed stand for USA, USC, UCLA, excellent to generate one giga volt per meter excitation gradient using the 30 to 50 giga electron bond, uh, electron volt beam in a one meter long lithium plasma. And uh, now I am talking about laser plasma accelerator. The electric field of laser in vacuum is given by this equation that is E is equal to 30 under root I 
volt per centimeter and for any uh, ultra uh, ultra short uh, intense laser beam the e is equal to 40 giga volt per centimeter if p is equal to 10 terawatt lambda 0 is equal to 1 mm and i is equal to 1.6 into 10 to the power 18 watt per centimeter square this is basically relativistic regime relativistic nonlinear optics of the plasma Unfortunately, this field is perpendicular to the direction of propagation and no significant acceleration takes place. Basically, the laser does not accelerate the particles directly in the direction of propagation of the light pulse. Hence, it is like a boat on a lake. The laser's electromagnetic wave pushes through the plasma in the case of an ionized gas and separates the negatively and positively charged. And the longitudinal electric field associated with the excited electron plasma waves can be extremely large and can accelerate charged particles. Okay. Several methods have been proposed for driving a large amplitude high phase velocity plasma wave, such as uh, plasma wave field accelerator, the plasma beat wave accelerator, the laser wave field accelerator, and the self rotated laser wave field accelerator. This light source, uh, uh, these schemes, this is plasma based field acceleration, which is based on particle beam driven. And these three schemes are based on the laser driven plasma based acceleration. One is laser wave field acceleration, the second is plasma beat wave acceleration, and the third is self modulated laser uh, wave field acceleration or scheme. So laser driven plasma based acceleration, what is a what what is a plasma wave field? First thing is that uh, just a, just like a capacitor where two oppositely charged parallel plates generates an electric field that can accelerate particles from one plate to the another. Similarly, in a plasma, a similar field can arise when a driver, such as a such as a laser pulse, separate negatively charged electrons from positively charged ions. And this charge separation can remain a stable configuration, the so called wave field. If the effective size of the driver is less than the plasma wavelength, which characterizes the length for a coherent response to a charge displacement, inside the wave field, the electric field expressed as a voltage gradient can reach 1 terabolt per meter. And by comparison, conventional accelerators can only reach gradients of 100 megavolt per meter before they run the risk of being damaged by electric discharge. The first scheme is laser wake field acceleration scheme. And laser wake field accelerators use an interaction between an intense and short laser pulse and plasma to accelerate electrons. This is basically a method for accelerating particles called wake field acceleration has not noticed up its output energy, bringing it closer to its goal of shrinking the size of accelerator facilities. When a boat travels through water, you can see in this figure, it produces a wake behind it, like that. This is called a wake. The phase velocity of the wave is just the speed of the boat. So we can use a laser pulse traveling at close to velocity of light in a plasma to drive the strong wave behind it. And the wave in this case is an electron plasma oscillation. This is uh, basically uh, electron plasma frequency. Because these are high frequency oscillation, uh, basically uh, electron plasma waves are high frequency, uh, uh, high frequency wave. And because these are high frequency oscillations, the ion do not move. And we can have very strong electric field. So in this scheme, when an ultra-short, ultra-intense laser pulse propagates plasma, it pushes the plasma electrons from the high-intensity region to the lower-intensity region of the beam due to conformative force, which is proportional to the negative gradient of laser intensity. Basically, conformative force is the uh, 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 pressure excited by the laser beams in the plasma. That is conformative force. That is proportional to the negative gradient of laser intensity. And you can see in this figure, plasma electron pushes away by conformative force, like this. And electrons turns back by charge separation. You can see here. 
and ion cavity formed and electrons are cavity here ion cavity is formed and basically the electrons will be excited so the ions of the plasma are not affected by the conductive force due to their large mass and ultra short duration of the laser and the electrons are pulled back towards their original position by the positive ions but their momentum causes them to overshoot and subsequently to oscillate about their initial position the separation of electron and ions forced by the laser was therefore excited in the electron density wave known as plasma wave field which trails the driving laser pulse in a single mandal to the water wave flown in a moving wave Uh, moving way, sorry, moving board. So, under this condition, a correctly, a correctly injected bunch of electrons can be excited by the longitudinal field of the plasma wave. See in this figure, where an electron bunch is injected in the plasma wave midway, wave midway between every two alternate plasma wave peaks, like this. and this is uh, uh, this figure shows the scheme of laser driven electron acceleration the laser pulse propagate to the right and generate a plasma wave in its way and electron bunch has been injected into the wave and is accelerated by the electric field pointing in the laser forward direction the separation of electron and ions within the plasma wave set up huge electric fields which can be used to accelerate charged particles the wave field in the plasma travels with the phase velocity here you can say that equal to the group velocity of the laser pulse which is close to the speed of the light and the wave field propagates at the speed of the laser pulse and so it can be used to excite particle particles to relativistic energy uh, finally this is by this scheme this is scheme driven in 200 mm long plasma channels have been used to reach an electric energy electron energy of 7.8 giga electron volt okay the second scheme is also very important that is uh, plasma bit wave acceleration scheme and in this scheme a relativistic plasma wave is resonantly excited by the conductive force of the two lasers separated by the plasma frequency and this is done by approximately adjusting the laser frequency and plasma density to satisfy the resonant condition that means the difference of laser frequency is equal to the uh, frequency of the plasma Uh, when this is satisfied large and uh, electron plasma wave can be generated the two laser beams this is one laser beam and this is another laser beam here the two laser beams beat together forming a modulated beam pattern in the plasma the superposition of these laser beams creates a low frequency beat pattern on the laser envelope with there is a associated conductive force and if the frequency of the force is resonant with the electron cyclotron frequency omega p a large sorry electron plasma frequency omega p a large amplitude relativistic electron plasma can be produced and the previous work has shown that the bit wave scheme is a reliable and reproducible method for generating plasma waves having relativistic phase velocity acceleration acceleration gradient of 1 to 3 giga electron volt per meter over approximately 10 mm and 100 giga electron volt per meter over a 2 mm intersection length have been reported for plasma bit wave accelerators okay we have done some work on the bit wave acceleration scheme using different profile of laser beams which is produced in these genders and uh, i want uh, to show some important result here four gaussian profile of laser beam you can see that the amplitude of electron plasma wave is increased by increasing the intensity of the second laser beam here we have uh, we use two laser beams we use two lasers and they are lasers so the uh, wavelength of these lasers are 1064 nm and 1053 nm okay beating of these lasers excite a very high amplitude uh, very high amplitude electron plasma wave uh, plasma wave which excite electrons to very high energies so here we fixed the intensity of first laser beam and the uh, intensity of 3 and 4.5 corresponding to 3.3 into 10 to the power 8 watt per centimeter square 4.98 into 10 to the power 18 watt per centimeter square and so on. you can see here in the uh, slide 
but important result is what when we increase the intensity of certain laser beam the amplitude of excited electron wave is increased significantly and the energy gained by electrons also increases significantly you can see here when we increase the intensity of certain laser beam the intensity uh, sorry the energy gained by electrons increases significantly and so plasma of frequency is also a very important parameter uh, here if we increase the value of plasma frequency the amplitude of excited electron wave uh, increases drastically and the energy gained by electrons also increases drastically however for coarse gaussian laser beams one can see that uh, the amplitude of excited or uh, the power or the electric field associated with the electron plasma wave is uh, increases with increasing the values of um, the values of discentered parameter you can say that for cos quotient profile discentered parameter is there that is b is equal to 0 0 0.5 and 1 at b is equal to b is equal to 0 this beam the cos quotient laser beam will be will be a gaussian laser beam so in comparison to gaussian beam the electric field or the amplitude of excited electron wave excited uh, increases very drastically uh, so in the case of uh, energy gain is also drastically uh, enhanced by increasing the values of discentered parameter of post post gaussian laser beam so one can say that in comparison to gaussian laser profile post gaussian profile uh, of laser beam is more suitable for excluding charged particles to high energies. The third scheme is self-modulated uh, laser wake field acceleration. And in this scheme, enhanced wake fields are generated. That means accelerating fields are more than an order of magnitude greater than those generated by a laser pulse in LWFA scheme. So the cumulative effect of the self-focusing and the self-modulation of the laser envelope by the initial perturbation of the electron plasma density generates a plane of laser pulse which become resonant with the plasma wave. And these effects are described in this figure. Here you can see that. This is initial laser pulse. This is the, uh, uh, this is the density of electron plasma wave. When we increase the density of electron plasma wave, there are a lot of uh, chip uh, in, the, in the laser pulse okay so the cell modulated laser uh, wave fields regime occur when a laser pulse duration exceeds the plasma period and when the laser power exceeds the critical power for cell focusing and uh, the initial gaussian laser pulse becomes modulated at the plasma wavelength during its propagation and this mechanism which is close to the forward domain scattering instability can be described as the decomposition of an electron electromagnetic wave into plasma wave at frequency shifted by the plasma frequency so self modulated uh, lwfa is a hybrid scheme combining elements of srfs and the laser wave field concept and SRF, that is Raman forward, uh, Raman forward scattering, describes the decay of a light wave at frequency omega zero into light waves at frequency omega zero plus minus omega b and a plasma frequency omega b. Uh, phase velocity of uh, electron plasma waves is nearly equal to the velocity of light. And in this scheme, a long intense pulse modulated itself into something like a boat vapor, uh, boat wave structure by the Raman forward, uh, Raman forward scattering instability, so called because it assembles the Raman scattering of light from molecules. But in this case, it is a particularly uh, parametric instability in which, the, in which the scattered light and plasma wave grows exponentially at the expense of the pumping uh, radiation. Here one can see that this is self modulated laser pulse. Okay, This is laser envelope here, and this is basically excited plasma. So this is important, self-modulated laser pulse is important. Due to this one, the accelerator, the, accelerator, uh, the acceleration gradient of uh, such type of accelerators will be increased drastically. So the incident electromagnetic wave couples its energy into a relative slip propagating plasma wave and two electromagnetic daughter waves with frequencies separated up and down by the plasma frequency. And a group of scientists working with the Vulcan laser has reported observation of electrons at energy as high as it is 120 mega electron volt 
for self modulated laser wave field accelerators but uh, dephasing and depletion length are two important factor which reduce the uh, acceleration uh, acceleration gradient of uh, plasma based particle uh, accelerators so dephasing is what the electrons are accelerated behind the laser pulse in the case of wake but travel faster than the laser so at some point the electrons will catch up with the laser and deface in respect to the accelerating structure which is given by this person basically electrons travel slightly faster than the wave eventually they stop being accelerated and this is called basically dephasing and the other thing is depletion and during propagation the laser will dissipate energy and lose energy okay. and the uh, fourth scheme is particle beam driven plasma wave field accelerator scheme. In this scheme, it was realized that an intense relativistic charge particle beam instead of laser beam can also drive the wave fields. In this case, the space charge field in, in place of the wake of the bunch acts on the plasma electrons. A plasma based particle accelerator driven by a char charged particles known as plasma wave field accelerator was proposed by Chen ETL in year 1985. And this is basically a particular type of a collinear wave field accelerator. And this is one of the advanced accelerator scheme studies as a high ultra gradient alternative to today radio frequency technology. One important feature of this scheme is that acceleration can be maintained over a long distance since unlike with the laser driver, dephasing is not relevant for relativistic electron beam drivers and the driving beam does not diverge strongly. So plasma beam driven, plasma based electron acceleration is one of the most actively pursued, pursued advanced acceleration scheme. Whereas in the laser wave field case, the radiation pressure known as the condomotive force pushes away the plasma electrons. Here the force is due to the space charge of the electron beam, I already told. In this scheme, the wave field is driven by an intense high energy charged particle beam when it passes through the plasma. Electron or positron beam can be used to excite the wave field. Uh, this figure shows uh, the operation of plasma wave, wave field accelerator. Here, driving force is basically electron beam, space charge of drive beam, displaced plasma electrons, and restoring, restoring force that plasma ion excites restoring force and space charge oscillation as in the case of harmonic oscillators exist here and high accelerating gradient to be achieved. So electron or positron beam can be used to excite the wave field. In the case of an electron beam, the space charge on the electron bunk blows out the plasma electrons while which while trying to regain equilibrium position overshoot it and set up plasma oscillations. So when a second bunch containing fewer particles than the driver will be injected in the wake at appropriate phase, they can be trapped and accelerated. And uh, that is uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center has mapped the physics of electron positron beam driven wakes and has shown acceleration gradient of 42 giga volt per meter using electron beams with metal scale plasmas. So in the first important SLAC experiment, only one electron bunch was used to excite the wave field. Since the energy of driver pulse was 42 giga electron volt, both the electrons and the waves are moving at a velocity close to C. So there is no relative motion between the electrons and the wave field. And because the electron bunch was also longer than the plasma period, most of the electrons in the drive bunch lose energy in exciting the wave but some electrons in the back have gained together energy from the wave fields as the wave field changing sign. Uh, considering the importance of accelerator, Department of Atomic Energy initiated major... Please confirm the thought. Okay, sir. Uh, major uh, programs to construct acceleration in India. The major accelerators, accelerator facility presently operating include the variable energy, circulate on at variable energy, Sucklerton Center, Calcutta, 14 MEV, uh, uh, Peloton of Bar and Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, TIFR, uh, Mumbai, and 450 MEV Silverton Radiation Sources, that is known as Indus 1 and other Catalan. The BAE has now 
taken up construction of even large accelerators, namely the 2.5 giga electron volt SRS power cathode in the superconducting subdetonate BECC Calcutta. In addition, RR cathode work have programs to develop medical and industrial application accelerators. Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research Calpacam has a program to set up accelerators for medical science research. Uh, basically, laser plasma acceleration has demonstrated for energy gains of 1 mega electron volt to 200 mega electron volt, electric field of 1 giga volt per meter to 1000 giga volt per meter, good e electron field quality, charge at high energy, quasi mono energetic, and very high peak current that is about 100 kilo ampere. And laser plasma accelerator advantage uh, provide even with new parameters. So, Provide electron beam with, beam with new parameters, high current, and provide electron beam, beam with new parameters, collimated, compact, and low cost. So the beauty of uh, laser based, uh, laser driven plasma based accelerator is uh, uh, the compact side as well as high acceleration rating. So plus batteries are enhanced stability, electron sources up to one giga electron board, guiding our uh, uh, petawatt class uh, laser systems, single space and generate a tunable electron beam application of these electron sources, as well as compact X-rays, three electron lasers. The dawn of compact particle accelerator as is here, laser plasma accelerator is greater than 100 mega electron volt. Numerous applications for 100 mega electron volt to one giga electron volt beams in medicine, light sources, and industry. Future goals for laser plasma accelerators are mono-energetic multi-giga electron volt beams, and with advanced in laser technology, the tera electron volt energy scale is long term target. And uh, here we have discussed on uh, plasma based acceleration, wave field uh, uh, generation, strength of uh, plasma based particle scales. Uh, much progress has been made and much more to be expected in this dynamic field. Many issues are still to be resolved and many more ground to cover, which will happen in the coming days. Uh, finally, laser plasma interaction will drastically reduce the size and cost of the electron accelerators of the future. And genuine technological revolution is underway, which will help science address the challenging and facing society today. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brohit, for this interesting talk. And uh, since we are running shortage of time, and we can have one or two quick questions from the audience. Okay. Okay, sir. Any question? The talk is now open for the discussion. Any question from anyone? Either a students, faculty member, or the experts? I don't think there is any question now. Okay, sir. Once again, I am thankful to the. Uh, thank you very much. Once again, giving me this opportunity. Thank and you, now we are moving to second talk, and I think uh, the speaker is here, Dr. Deepak Joshi. Yeah. Good morning, sir. I am here. Uh, okay. Good morning. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Deepak Joshi from IIT Delhi. So before inviting Dr. Joshi, I would like to give you a brief introduction. Uh, Dr. Deepak Joshi is an assistant professor at Center for Biomedical Engineering, IIT Delhi, and a joint faculty at All India Institute of Medical Science, New Delhi. He received his PhD in Biomedical Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, and a postdoctorate from University of Oregon, USA, in Human Physiology. He also worked at National University of Singapore, and Newcastle University UK before joining the IIT Delhi as a faculty. He has a technology transfer and granted US pattern to his credit. He is a passionate teacher and has received teaching excellence award at IIT Delhi in the year 2017. He was also awarded the membership of the American Association of Advancement in Sciences in the year 2014. Dr. Joseph's current research work combines experimental and computational techniques to understand the neural correlates during walking and balancing for the diagnosis of neuromuscular disorder and for the development of the assistive device, devices for stroke survivors 
uh, amputees, elderly population, and Parkinson's patients. This research laboratory is primarily funded by Department of Science and Technology and Indian Council of Medical Research. So with this brief, I'll say brief because he has a very vast experience in the, his field. I invite Dr. Joshi to deliver a talk on the topic, force myography, a uh, paradigm shift from electromyography for neural engineering. So Dr. Joshi, now the task is yours. Thank you, Professor Ramallah. Thanks for such a nice introduction. So one, one small thing that was missing in my introduction is that uh, I'm also an alumni of HNPGU. So I have oh, that. Sorry. I, I forgot to mention it because it is not written here, but uh, yeah, nice. yeah, probably it was the last you. minute. You're, you're most welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, sir. So uh, yeah, so I'll just uh, uh, share my screen and I'll continue with that. Okay, okay please. So probably my screen is visible. Am I, am I audible? Not yet. Yeah, it's coming. Is it there? Yeah, it's there. Okay. okay. There. Thank you very much. So yeah, so thank you, uh, Dr. Manis and uh, Professor Asibat, to uh, give me an opportunity to share my work. Uh, as you can see the title, probably I'm a very big misfit to the conference title. But uh, trust me, at the end of my lecture, you will not feel regret to attend this invited talk. So uh, I'm a faculty at uh, Center for Biomedical Engineering at IIT Delhi, where I'm heading the Neuromechanics Research Laboratory. I'm also a joint faculty at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, where I take care of the Department of uh, Biomedical Engineering. Uh, so what I will do is probably I'll share some of my work. And one of a very specific work from my lab is related to biomedical, sorry, biomaterials, uh, which I have kept at the end of the slide to make sure that everybody attends my lecture. So that's kind of a strategy I am following. So I am not very much core into the material science or engineering, but when I joined IIT Delhi in 2016, uh, after two years of that, there was a uh, announcement from IIT Delhi, which is here that a department of material science and engineering was launched in the same year 2018 on 1st of january so that indicates that the leading institute in the country as well as abroad are are now ready to take material science as well as the engineering component component of that to to the market to the society and to the mass health care so in the material science and engineering we have diverse background people coming from chemistry coming from electrical uh, I'm basically from electrical and instrumentation engineering. So uh, I will give a brief idea of um, about my lab first, and then I will go through some of the work, which probably will uh, give an indication uh, what kind of material work we can uh, take over. So uh, this is the neuromechanics lab at IIT Delhi, which I started in uh, 2016, immediately after I joined from uh, returning from USA. Uh, we do a lot of experimental and computational techniques work and brain is our main food to, to get our research hunger out into that. Uh, we also try to understand the neural mechanism of balance in gait and healthy and amputee population. We do a lot of artificial uh, intelligence work in our projects and a very recent work which I will touch upon at a very uh, you know peripheral stage is bridging Ayurveda and neural engineering. So some of the pictures you can see here are the outcomes of the product from my lab. And I will go into the detail with uh, these products slowly. Yeah. So these are the available facilities in my lab. As you can see the left uh, most figure, we, can, we have a facility to map the brain, how the neurons are firing in the brain for a particular activity. Uh, in the ne next one, you can see this EMG system, which is the electrical activity of the muscles being recorded wirelessly. Uh, third one is a very interesting device, which is called FES system, functional electrical stimulation, which is electrically stimulating the muscles of the people who have lost the control of the brain in their muscles. For example, paralysis patient, for example, spinal cord injury patients. And we also do a lot of sports biomechanics where we uh, record various joint positions, joint angles to develop the sports therapy or uh, sports devices. These, uh, the bottom column, you can, bottom row you can see are the outcomes of the products from my lab. And because uh, many of the audience are from physics background, I will not go into the detail because it will involve a lot of 
control algorithms hardware electronics and i will i will rather uh, you know discuss about the application part and slow and a, and a, and a very brief into the technical technology part of that uh, these are the major fundings coming from different funding agency to my laboratory and i have not uh, put all of them only those who are relevant to this talk which are relevant to this uh, conference Yeah. So these are the patents overview and at the end I will discuss for the upcoming researchers that what we need to now switch the gear from publications to the devices that I will discuss at the end and that is why I put it at the end because uh, that will be my overall message to the coming researchers as well as the current faculties to guide the student for that. So these are some of the patents uh, from uh, US as well as India. So one of the work that we, we do a lot uh, is basically, uh, you know, uh, developing the artificial limbs uh, for the people, those who have lost the limb either due to the cancer or due to the uh, accidents. So, so losing a limb may be a very common phenomena or very, very uh, unnoticeable thing for a healthy person. But if you see, if you dream, just dream that one morning you wake up and you don't have a leg or you don't have a hand. Imagine your life, what will be at that point of time. So for you, it is a dream or for you, it is just like a nightmare. But for some people, it is a part of their life, right? So we want to touch upon the lives of these people and see how our, how our science or how our technology can, you know, help these people. So what we do is, I will not go into the detail, but you can see a kind of sensors that is developed. One, and you can see on the left side, a person who has lost his limb due to an accident in Delhi. And what we do is we wrap these sensors around the circumference of the thigh because what happens even if somebody lose his limb, there are the electrical signals coming from the brain, right? Because brain is still intact. Brain is still thinks that there is something I have to send the signal. So they are called phantom signals or dummy signals. We capture those dummy signals, decode them through artificial intelligence and then imagine or then try to predict that what kind of movement the person want to do and then translate that decoding into the real time devices which you can see at the bottom of these uh, you know uh, bottom of the slide uh, as i said i'll not go into the detail but i can show you some of the videos which will help you to understand how these technology actually work so what we do is you can see this is a healthy human being and he is walking on the level ground and then walking on a different uh, terrain which can be stair which can be a ramp which can be going up which can be going down so you can imagine a lot of different movements we do throughout the day yeah, is there any question? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Audible, please go ahead. Okay. Sorry, I heard something, so I thought if there is some question. So yeah. So so what we do is basically we ask the healthy people to walk and we and we actually try to decode what is happening in the brain. For example, if I ask you a question that at what point of time before negotiating with the stair or before we were climbing on the stair what is the time stamp when you look on the stair to see how what is the height of a stair nobody of you can answer that right but it is it is it is at most essential that you look on the stair because if you don't look on the stair you can walk with the closed eyes which is not possible it means you look on the stair you send the signal to the brain that this is the height of the stair so please actuate my muscles so that i can overcome the stairs but how this happens in the brain nobody knows we try to answer that and how do we answer how do we find how do we solve this mystery is through this video i would like to show you at the bottom you can see the person is walking and we are capturing his eye movements as well as his brain you can see there are a lot of sensors in the brain which captures his eye movement so we want to see what happens in the brain once we know that we actually decode it and then develop it into a device which is very useful for the people who are not having the limbs i'll show you this video and probably you will get the feeling of that Thank you. 
Yeah, so because we have a very less time, so I won't go into the detail of this video. But this guy actually also won uh, some medals in uh, Haryana State Olympics while wearing what this device. So now we have fit this device on many clinical populations. This is my lab picture. You can see there is a treadmill where they come and use this device to practice with this. Because for brain, this is a new device. This is not his own natural leg. So brain needs to be trained for this kind of new, you know, interface for the body. So, so far we have fitted it and after uh, clinical trials, we have actually, uh, you know, uh, tech technology transfer to a company which has completely transformed the device and I'll show you the video uh, where now this device is available in the market to buy. So I'll just uh, show you the video where the company has developed it in a very, uh, you know, uh, commercial way. Uh, just give me a second. Yeah, so you can see the video here. a dorsiflexion angle of more than 30 degrees which gives the movement of an ankle joint. The continuous curved rocker bottom provides an effortless and jerkless walk. The innovation in material and design delivers a higher energy storage and return. The grace absorbs energy during stance and releases it during toe off. This gives a faster and longer walk to the person. Yeah, so probably uh, uh, that was something I was, uh, uh, you know, uh, we were working and then uh, just give me a second. I'll, I think probably have my slides. Yeah. So, yeah. So FUPRO is our, uh, you know, uh, industrial collaborator with the, which we work together to, you know, develop the devices such way. So other than that, our group has recently initiated the projects to bridge the Ayurveda and neural engineering. So Ayurveda is personally very close to me, uh, being born and brought up at, uh, you know, uh, Himalaya region. I, I mean, uh, I'm basically from Gopeshwar district Chamoli and I have been in touch with various, you know, uh, uh, people who follow Ayurveda. We have, you know, these are like uh, in our blood. So, so basically, uh, I, I, it was in my mind to, you know, uh, take this Ayurveda and give some scientific backup to these Ayurveda findings so that the Western research community can also accept it. But when I joined IIT Delhi, I was uh, initially uh, at a phase where I need to establish myself, I need to prove myself. So I did not took any risk, risky projects at that point of time. But recently, uh, I think probably last year, I got a funding to take this forward. Uh, uh, use, uh, use pressure from the ministry that these kind of things come out. If you want to do that, we have funding, please do that. So, so I took this project and here what I want to do is, you know, very popular exercise of pranayama, which is, sorry, which is called anulom and vilom. 
so we we do a lot of nostril breathing and it's very specific to the nostril so you can see here a device which was developed in my lab uh, almost 6 months back there are three sensors available here you can see two two holes for two nostrils and you can see the pressure sensor there microphone and the humidity sensor so we want to measure that when a specific nostril actually inhale or either exhale what is the what, at what velocity what pressure it inhale or exhale and what is the sound that comes right so we want to correlate it with the neural how the brain actually have a control over that so we developed this device and based on that we uh, you know continued some experiments you can see here uh, while wearing this device you can see the device on the close to the uh, just below the nostrils of the person wearing this and doing anulom bilom and we are recording the brain activity here so that way because i personally believe that ayurveda has a lot of potential but we have been little bit unfortunate that we could not find the scientific backup for that so that the western community can also accept that so i thought i should took up this challenge because it is very personal to me and i i have been a very big follower of these things so i i am trying to you know do this uh, neural engineering part we also have a collaborator from israel who who do you know a lot of uh, brain signal processing for us probably within 2 3 years you will see such kind of devices in the market from it daily uh, which will detect which will give you a bio feedback of how you are anulom because you see even we don't know whether the process of anulom vilom is correct or not we just do it by thinking we are doing it correctly imagine a student being without a teacher cannot proceed cannot be successful even eklavya wanted a statue of teacher to be successful so here we want to develop a automated system a artificial intelligence system which can be a teacher for a individual because you cannot send a teacher to everybody's house who are doing yoga and pranayama so we thought let's come up with a device which can be you know perform as a teaching in a teaching role for all these uh, people who wanted to follow the uh, anulom pranayama so this is the final study that i want to actually touch upon and this will i will touch technically also i request to chairman sir that if i cross the limit of 30 minutes please allow me 5 or 10 more minutes to make the essence out of my presentation so i i hope i will be given this much of liberty being an alumni of the institute at least so uh, yeah so this this talk is very interesting and this talks about that illusory sense of human touch from a warm and soft artificial hand so what we want to ask a specific research question is can the touch from an artificial hand be perceived by another person as if the touch was coming from human hand so let me tell you a brief background of that imagine that a person has lost his limb upper limb either accident or cancer or whatever now there are two cases there are two two side of this coin one side of the coin says that the researcher should make an artificial hand which is very functional which can function like a human hand the other side of coin which was investigated by me and my colleagues was a very interesting part of that coin the interesting part was we we actually did a survey and we found that most of the artificial limbs are being rejected by one of a very interesting reason and let me share that interesting reason with you when a artificial hand person handshakes with you you will you being a healthy person being a natural hand person you will immediately realize that the person who has done handshake with you has a artificial hand and this creates a social stigma because immediately you will ask a lot of question to you what happened to your hand what well, like there are a lot of questions right so this creates a social stigma for these people they don't want to go to the social gatherings because they know that you know hand shaking is a very common phenomena and if i hand shake the other people will notice i have artificial hand and you know that will give me a lot of social uh, inferiority so we thought can rather than functionality yes functionality is important functionality is the key of any artificial limb functionality of the organ is very important but can we develop a artificial hand which when touched by somebody we can make fool of that brain that it is not an artificial hand it is actually a normal hand so this was a long journey we did and we developed the artificial hand i will tell you the whole story through this presentation so human hand is very very you know remarkable in the sense you think you can hold a very soft soft uh, thing like egg when you hold egg can you see how precisely you control your muscles very precisely so that you don't want to break the egg but imagine when you are holding a bucket 
how hard your muscles become immediately because you don't want to lose the bucket right so your hand modulates the skin or you can say modulates the uh, material or sorry muscles property within a second right and it conforms to various shapes of object you hold a stick you can hold you hold a glass you can hold you can hold a mug anything you want to hold you can conform to that shape so in that way god has created a very remarkable you know species human that they can have this fantastic organ which is called human hand and it has a lot of social significance patting think of this a baby sleeps when you pat it immediately right so there is something remarkable with the human hand hugging you hug somebody the emotions are transferred you hand shake somebody the emotions are transferred but think does <clears throat> this loss of touch loss creates a social stigma to amputee and it it changes their social interaction as well so what we do is we conduct an experiment again uh, i'll not go into so much of details but there were three part of the experiment one was to create the artificial skin second was to design the artificial hand and third was to touch it so what we want is that whenever somebody touches this hand so he should not feel that it is artificial hand so the step one is here there is a lot of physics but i will skip that you can see lot of materials lot of uh, materials and lot of sewed over durometer which tells the softness we arrange them in a matrix in form of increasing softness in terms of row in terms of column it was increasing warmth you can see a micro heater at the bottom and there is a microcontroller is electro electronics part on that so i'll not go into the detail then we are uh, we created is we took a ct scan of a person who has a healthy hand we created bones we created the mat material of skin and then we combined them and created an artificial hand then we created a experimental setup where we asked the participant to be touched by three different hand one is a human hand one is the hand without the heating and softness another was in heating and softness but this heating is not random this heating and softness come from previous two experiments right so don't think it's just two slide of work it's all for 6 months of work i am representing in three slides so probably you can imagine the uh, uh, how much of efforts has gone i'll show in this video how the all things combines and work together
Yeah. So you can see in this video, the results finally conclude that you can create an illusion in the brain that the touch is not coming from the artificial hand. The touch is coming from the natural hand. So this was a very remarkable study which was covered by BBC also because this was the very first walk which was actually covering the bridging the gap between the functionality of a prosthetic hand and its social acceptance. And this was considered as one of the most popular article in the most prestigious journal of our area, which is called IEEE Transaction on Neural System and Rehabilitation Engineering. So yeah, with this, uh, this is all about my work, which I briefly, you know, kind of touched upon. There are many other studies, uh, but here comes the meat of my presentation. The meat of my presentation is that there is a need of coming out of our comfort zone as of now in our country. I agree that publications are important, but these are important for our personal CVs. We can only improve our CV by publications. We can only improve our H index in Google by, by getting publications. We can only become assistant to associate, associate to professor by these. The real dearth right now or the real need is right now the innovations. The need of developing devices taken to the market and let these devices being used by your own people. So that is what the challenge I have taken in the last five years in my lab. And with this, you can see this is a very remarkable efforts by uh, IIT's professors where I was one of the representative uh, from IIT Delhi. Biomedical engineering so far was nowhere in the map. In 2016, when I joined with IITM professor, I actually asked them to push that there is a need of biomedical engineering in India because otherwise we will be importing just a blood pressure monitor from either Singapore or China. So I, I would like to say you, I mean, I have been publishing a lot. You can see that in last five years, I have been publishing in top tie journals. But what I feel here is this, my message, which was published, I think day before yesterday in a leading newspaper, The Statesman, where myself and Professor Mani Vannan from IIT Madras was interviewed uh, and we have prepared a white paper on that to the government of India that now this is a high time to go for innovations. Every research paper should lead. I agree that science is important. Today's science is tomorrow's engineering and tomorrow's engineering is day after tomorrow's science. But if we don't go in parallel, then we will be just increasing our impact factor. We'll be just increasing our H index. But the, 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 the money paid by income tax uh, from the people of our country will not be benefited out of our research just imagine that the freedom given to an academician is remarkable can you think of my i am an electrical or biomedical or instrumentation engineer by my degree but i am working on ayurveda can you think that this kind of freedom can be given to anybody in the country or across the globe that is why academics is something very spiritual very very holistic you are given freedom to serve your people by your knowledge by your intellectual so it's a high time I want to convey to the people in the conference, uh, to the faculty. I know many of them are so senior to me, but I just want to share my experience that it is more happiness to see the device you developed wearing by the people rather than seeing a publication on the H index or in the Google index. That is what I felt from my experience in five years. And I'm pushing hard to take it more forward. So uh, with this, I want to thank, uh, and I would like to really thank uh, Dr. Manish, uh, organizers of the conference to give me this great opportunity to share my work. Uh, Professor Notial is there. I, I have been privileged to be taught by him, but for a very short instant in Gopeshwar, I think probably it was three or four months, but that was really good. Uh, and I, I, I mean, many of the professors are there, which I could not, uh, you know, find myself lucky enough to be taught by them, but uh, their footprints are always in my life. And I feel that with these blessings, I will take all these things forward. And probably in coming years, I will have some more interesting theories or more interesting results to show to all of you. Thank you very much, Dr. Manis and Dr. Bhatt. Uh, thank you, Dr. Joshi, for this nice and informative talk. And I'm sure that uh, there will be many questions on this particular topic. So this topic is directly related to the human being, or I'll say that benefit of the human being. And ultimate aim is the benefit of the human being. So this talk is now open for the discussion and we can have few questions on this particular talk or related to this talk. Any question from your students? Yeah, excuse me, sir. I have a ah, question. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, sir, as you talked about uh, Anulom Viloma and Ayurveda, so 
sir as per ayurveda uh, what, is, what, is, what is your name and you are from where please sorry sir my name is devrat kanswal and uh, i am a student of fourth semester msc uh, srk okay. campus hnb gadol university okay, uh, okay. as per ayurveda both our nostrils you have mean? different functionalities so right. have you found any uh, scientific evidence of this statement yeah so our first target populations are uh, pregnant women unfortunately in india pregnant women are not being taken care until unless there is some triesty so we want to monitor their 9 months of period entirely 9 months of period through their nostril profile because in the ayurveda it has been mentioned that you know whenever you are under stress your breathing pattern actually changes in the fourier domain so we want to actually analyze the whole data set in terms of artificial intelligence to come up with a strategy that how a pregnant woman can be treated at home with such a way so that her delivery can be a memorable event for her rather than being something she wants to forget so there are some evidence in terms of heart rate variability we also measure the ecg and there are some evidences that specific nostril breathing if you do it correctly has a huge potential to actually modulate your neural firings okay just give me a second i'll just plug in my uh, charger because i think my battery is about to die just give me one second okay by that time if somebody want to ask a question you can raise the hand yes please any other question from any student or faculty member i think there is no more question hello so if there is no more question i would like to thank hello. dr jus for his remarkable work Thank you very much. Of the biomedical science, and I am sure that uh, uh, you are not only working for the IIT Delhi, but you are also keeping forward the name of the Garhwal University as alumni of the Garhwal University. So I am sure that you will have some remarkable work in the future. So with that, I thank you once again for your this. Hello, sir. I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. One My, question. Myself, Vidya Bhushan from H N V Garhwal University. I am pursuing B Tech. from information technology so okay. my simple question is uh, we can control our feeling uh, by artificial intelligence as suppose your example is resume yes of course i think a uh, lot of the things are being you know being governed by your brain right so that's why they say that there if there is a will there is a way uh, if you see the clinical meaning of that the cleaning meaning in, it indicates that you always have a power to fire your brain uh, with your own will but that needs something you know which is out of the training which is out of the will right so there are many evidences i can uh, refer to one of the study which is not from my group but uh, university of washington where what they did is two people sitting at two different places in the park and one is wearing the eeg cap the other is also wearing the eeg cap this guy who is let 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 them name a and b so a guy just think that he want to move his hand but b guy is not thinking like that but because of this neuro modulation this goes wirelessly to the another setup on the other b person and he actually hit his hand like this even though he does not want right so you can actually control the actions of the other person and that is what uh, you might have heard a very new term in in clinical society that is called neuroplasticity that your brain is plastic if it is deformed like this it has a capability to come like this right but then to 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 reach to that point or to have enough evidence to say that you need to prove it scientifically right so we are doing some studies where the stroke patients when there is a stroke the blood clotting in the brain actually the signals are not coming to the hand now what we are trying to do is we are artificially you know giving the electric current to the hand so that it can move because brain is not sending signal we are artificially injecting the signal or artificially injecting the current to move the signal and we have so seen some evidence that if you do that slowly your brain come back to its original position so it's a clinical study probably it will take another 2 3 years to be commercial or to be in the clinical setup so yeah there are there is a lot of opportunity i mean uh, brain is something you know everyone wants to you can you can think of this artificial intelligence all the algorithms coming in the artificial intelligence by the computer scientist are borrowed from the brain how our brain thinks they they first learn how the brain do imagine somebody calls you 
without knowing the name without knowing who is on the other side if he or she says hello you can by just listening to that hello you can say whether he is a male or female right it means your brain has a super power of pattern recognition but where is that power located in the brain where is it is hidden in the brain if i can figure it out if i can discover that hidden power i can translate that power into a chip which can work as a artificial intelligence that is what the artificial intelligence so every new algorithm coming in the artificial intelligence should be very clear that it is coming from learning how the brain works there is no knowledge of intrinsic computer scientist it comes from the brain they learn first the brain and then they actually to convert that into the algorithms thank you thank you sir thank you thanks again dr joshi thank you sir and uh, hello sir oh uh, one more question sir yes, yes sir okay sir i am vikas sir yeah vikas please go ahead sir i am from gadwal university birla campus sir i want to ask that is there any way to con to command our subconscious mind or any means yes so yeah so think of that so as i said whenever you are walking and you climb on stairs there is a certain period of time between the ground and the stair when you look to the ground when you look on the stair and tell your brain tell your brain is not speaking tell your brain through neural signal that this is the height of the stair so you ask your brain that this is the height of my stair so please actuate my muscles so that i can overcome this stair right now in healthy person because you are healthy your brain is trained in such a way from your childhood that you actually over you do it subconscious you never notice it so if i ask okay. you this question have you thought of this when a baby is born it takes him 2 year to walk or sometimes 3 years to walk but when a animal baby is born for example cow elephant within a day they walk what is the difference how is it possible so these kind of questions should be answered that is the true science and that true science should be governed by the true engineering to overcome that so subconscious level is always there which can be you know noticed or unnoticed based on the training component that you have gone through sir one more question sir please go ahead one more okay is there any possibility to control in upcoming future by technology or subconscious sir probably can we control yes. our subconscious yes, mind yes. by technology probably, probably yes i don't want to kind of vouch for that or to claim on that but probably it won't be not very difficult to do that i mean things are there which give some indication that it should be possible in coming future okay i think uh, hello if, uh, if, uh, anyone has a question they can put the question in the comment box and uh, i request dr joshi sure thank you so those question because you are running shortage of time yeah yeah i understand so that we have understand. to stop here <laughs> but if anybody has the question they can put the question in comment box please and he will be happy to answer this question thank you once again dr joshi thank you and we still have the three presentation left for the for today and uh, i think all three are present here and i would like to say that uh, suvendu shekhar kohli gaurav karnataka and nilam rani i think all three are present here so i will start with the first presentation that oral presentation that is by dr suvendu shekhar kohli and the title of presentation is belting transition in two dimensional colloidal suspension so is the speaker present here Subhendu Sekar Kohli uh, from uh, IOP Bhubaneswar. I am here. Okay, okay. Please start your presentation. Yeah, you are audible. Please share your screen. Hello. Yeah, you are audible. Subhendu, can you listen us? Hello. Yes, sir. please go ahead. Can I see? Yeah, your presentation is visible, and please go ahead. Doctor Subhendu, uh, can sorry, you? Sorry, sir, I can't hear you. Can you see the screen? Yes, the screen is visible.
हेलो यस शुभेंदु कंटिन्यू हेलो यस वी हेयर यू कंटिन्यू so uh, so i'm assuming so this is okay okay this continue
Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank, uh, thanks to, uh, for, to me for uh, giving me opportunity to present my work in international conference on recent advances in material science. Uh, today, my research topic is uh, synthesis and structural characterization of samarium doped silica nanopowder. Uh, I am Neelam. And uh, this work is done under the supervision of Dr. Rachna Ahlawat, Department of Physics, Chaudhary Devilal University, Sirsa, uh, from Haryana. Uh, this is the abstract slide for my research work. In this current research work, uh, we demonstrate the th synthesis of samarium doped silica nanopowder through wet chemical like soil gel technique. Uh, the performance of this method is absolutely correct for massive production and it is also a profitable in the sense of money. Uh, the ready sample are treated thermally at temperature 900 degrees Celsius. Here we are used to sample one first is as prepared or we can say that as groomed sample uh, which is prepared at room temperature and second one is annealed at 900 degrees Celsius. Uh, and these the characterizations are uh, sportive with di different techniques such as XRD uh, X-ray diffraction, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, and scanning electron microscope SAM, uh, which is with uh, joint with EDX energy dispersive X-ray spectra. Uh, the cubic phase of prepared sample is confirmed by XRD with average crystalline size 18 nanometer uh, using well-known day by star formula with lattice constant calculated as 10.8 angstrom. Surface surface morphology. Uh, give the structure information uh, from SAM study. And the investigation proposed that different nanoscopic collaboration play a key role in defining the morphology and crystal phase of the prepared material. Presently, activity in this field is concentrated on synthesis of phosphorus by using advanced technique and inspecting novel applications in the area of electronics, photonics, display detectors, optical amplification, and fluorescent sensing device. This is the intro introduction of my... It's better uh, if you skip the introduction and come to results directly. Okay, sir. Thanks. This is a synthesis and characterization technique, uh, synthesis flowchart. And uh, this is the XRD of the my sample, prepared sample. Here T1 is defined as, as groomed or as prepared sample, sample at room temperature and T2 which is annealed at 900 degrees Celsius. There are some humps in uh, in the range of 22 uh, to 30 and 42 to 50. This uh, defines the silica humps. Uh, there is a preparation of the materials is starting. Uh, so there is lots of precursors, uh, starting precursors and uh, impurities are present in the prepared sample. So after annealing, there is sharp peak we can see uh, there uh, near the range of 28.29 degree and uh, these are uh, definitely ma match with the JCPDS card number 421461. Uh, this is FTIR analysis of the uh, sample T1 for as prepared sample and T2 for annealed sample. They, uh, these are the peak position of samarium silica powder samples as you can see in this slide. The different different vibration frequency range uh, corresponding to different uh, functional group from uh, starting to end point. There is main reason of uh, functional group is metal oxygen bonding that is samarium oxygen bonding uh, which is near the 470. This is called as fingerprint reason that is different for every uh, material and the intensity of the peaks are increased with increased in temperature. This is scanning electron microscopy SAM analysis uh, for the as prepared and uh, annealed sample which is annealed at 900 degrees Celsius. Uh, in, in the as prepared sample there is a uh, small accumulation the sample at uh, so that the, uh, this is really uh, a good spherical shape nanoparticles are uh, uh, obtained this is the edx spectra of uh, the prepared sample 
here different peaks are represent different elemental composition of the uh, present elements samarium oxygen silica large uh, intensified peak of silica defines the uh, silica uh, have on large amount having 43.90 atomic percentage and samarium has 0.767 uh, due to low concentration of the samarium in the silica and oxygen having 55.43 atomic percentage this is the conclusion of my research work that is samarium dropped in silica nano powder was synthesized with the help of sol gel method prepared sample are well crystalline with cubic in structure with slight volume of fraction of monoclinic phase kerr formula helps to compute the average crystalline size that is 18 nanometer and sam was used for surface morphology simultaneously elemental composition with the help of joint edx spectra this is a re some references related to my work thank you uh, thank you very much for keeping the time and uh, okay. now i think we can have one or two question yes sir any question from the students faculty members if there is no question i think uh, we can try once again from uh, dr subindu sekhar kohli if he is he's still present here yes sir i am here i'm sharing the screen again Okay, we can hear you now, but uh, please share the screen and continue. If there is any problem, we'll um, write uh, in the comment box in between. Okay, okay. So, can you see the screen now? Yeah, it's coming up. So, yes. But uh, your presentation is not there. I mean... Present? You can't see the presentation screen? No, 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 no. It's your screen is there, but not the presentation. PPT is not there. I'm sharing it. It's your own photograph. We can see. <laughs> is it First visible? open the PPT and then share the screen. Is it visible now? Again, the same thing, no PPT. You are basically sharing the screen, but not the PPT. Your PPT may be in the background, just open. Yeah, now it's okay. Can you see it now? Yeah, we can see. Please go ahead. Okay. So, so I was saying I'm presenting the melting transition in two dimensional space. So the work is done uh, during my PhD under the supervision of Dr. Dipanjan Chakravarti and in collaboration with Dr. Debashish Chaudhary. Uh, this is, was the phase I am I was showing. It uh, serves as a introductory platform to the broad class of phase transition and i was discussing this i've uh, this uh, phase boundary between solid and liquid in three dimensional space we find that uh, solid melts into liquid always via first order transition and the talk here is based on a question what happens when we switch uh, to the lower dimensional space that is the two dimensional space but before coming into that question a more fundamental question arises whether in two dimensional space a stable crystalline order can be formed or not this question was first uh, addressed by rudolf Peirce. he showed in harmonic solid uh, the positional uh, fluctuation at a given temperature diverges uh, as a system size uh, in one dimension it diverges logarithmically with system size in two dimension and remains finite only in higher dimension now due to this uh, divergence in positional fluctuation if you look at the correlation function it shows a power law decay so there is this implies that uh, there is no stable crystal order in two dimensional space however in 1962 uh, elder and wayne wright uh, showed their work on elastic disk and they uh, observed in their study that uh, the system was showing a phase transition kind of behavior uh, it triggered the scientific community attention and people started to understand how the 
melting is happening in two dimensional space so in 1967 merman uh, worked on two dimensional colloids and he showed that uh, if we look at the bond angle fluctuation in those system it remains finite uh, irrespective of the system size so we conclude that uh, the 2d solids are characterized by quasi long range positional order together with the long range orientational order so uh, there is a most famous or most popular melting theory uh, for 2d uh, solids was given by costellis thaulis halpen nilsen and, and young which is in short known as kth and y theory it explains the melting behavior in two steps uh, it basically says the melting happens by unbinding of topological defects now what are the topological defects if you look at the uh, system in two dimensional space the most uh, densely packed lattice structure we can find is a triangular lattice in which each atom possesses six neighboring atoms so whenever in a real lattice uh, an atom has number of neighbors other than six we treat it as a defect particle there are two main class of uh, defects which involves in such kind of melting transition these are dislocation and disclination Discla dislocation is a bounded pair of fi five fold and seven fold defects according to this theory in solid phase this dislocation can be found in a paired form as we increase the temperature system gets enough energy so that these bound pair get dissociate and system reaches into an intermediate hexatic phase you can see here the, these are uh, freely presented dislocation here so, so this intermediate hexatic phase which is absent in three dimensional space can be found in 2d this phase is characterized with the short range translation order and quasi long range orientation order in the next in the next steps this association of dislocation happens and uh system reaches into a state where we can find free uh or isolated five fold and seven fold defects this phase belongs to the isotropic liquid phase uh other than this this theory also predicts the stability criteria for solid and hexatic phase says in stable solid phase the positional order should decay algebraically with the exponent having value less than equal to 1 and all the same in the exact phase in the stable hexatic order should decay algebraically with an exponent uh, having a value less than equal to 1 4. so both of these Transition in this theory are predicted to be continuous, and people ha have looked at this problem through numerical and analytical and experimental approach. And what they found that this hexatic liquid transition actually depends strongly on the inter-party interaction. So here in this work, uh, we have taken a system in which particle interacts with this WC potential, this form of the potential. We have performed molecular dynamics simulation using the uh, thermostat. This is the equation of motion which governs the particle dynamics. It has drag force term, white noise term, and an impact and dominant. This is the mechanism which has zero in and is data correlated. So, this is the phase diagram we observe for our system. Sir, you are at low temperature, high density. It's very disturbing. Yes, Your audio is very disturbing. I don't know. This first thing, case, then it appears. Are you using two devices? And only then uh, are you using two uh, devices? If we so uh, please switch off the uh, one device. Pure liquid phase here. So I'll be presenting my results at a constant temperature value equal to one and showing how the system behaves as it changes our density. So here first we have calculated this satisfactory factor. It clearly distinguishes different phases of the system depending on the density we are working on. So this is basically uh, density density correlation in the Fourier plane. As you can see, the you are not audible. Oh, this particle position. 
Are you using one device or two devices for this presentation? Too? No, not audible now. It's not here. You are audible sometimes, but very disturbed. So I'm connected. Am I on? It's very disturbing. Your sound is very disturbing. Hello. If you are using two devices, I mean one mobile and a laptop, then please switch off one because there is always disturbance. When you use the two devices, if it is only one, then we can't say anything. Let's change the slide, maybe. So now I leave it to the organizers what to do because it's not working. Uh, okay, uh, Shubhendu, uh, I think the uh, you are not audible here, and uh, so uh, I request all the partici uh, participants who listen you. If you have any questions and any queries, uh, you may put. Uh, sir, 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 is not here. Yes, sir. Can we stop it here? Yes, sir. Dr. Manish Unial. Yes, yes, sir. Shall we stop his presentation here? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because because the we are not audible the uh, Subhendu Sekar Khali. And if any participant have any questions, may leave they, it. Uh, they can put it on the comment box. It's because he is not audible and. Uh, I mean, you will not be able to answer the questions also. So it's better if you put the questions in comment box. So we can wait for uh, two or three minutes for this uh, for these questions, and then you can uh, I mean answer the questions with the comment box only. And uh, is there any question? One can raise the hand or one can write something. Or sir, if Subhendu sir is agree, then he can share his presentation in the uh, among the um, uh, this platform, sir. Um, I think uh, it's not audible. Please, please, write. Not, uh, there's a problem with the sound of the system so let's close it here and uh, i think uh, i must thank all the speakers especially that invited speakers and all contributed speakers but before closing i just want to check if third speaker is here dr gaurav karnataka he's not here but uh, so let me thank all of you for your presentation and for your valuable time and uh, before concluding, I'm very thankful to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share this session. And now this uh, platform is yours. So I hand over the platform to Dr. Mani Sunya. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for chairing the session. And uh, now the all the talks uh, and uh, uh, are completed here and i would like to thank all the speakers uh, professor sip krishna ghoshal uh, professor mahavir singh dr gunjan prohit dr deepak joshi followed by the three oral uh, presentations uh, i would like to thank all the speakers thank you thank you so much and now uh, we conclude here the second day of the conference and uh, uh, tomorrow tomorrow we have one in an invited speaker from uh, lp prohit sir gurukul kangri university but 
due to the health issue he is unable to deliver the talk so we a little reschedule the third day program of the conference and the information sent to all the speakers and concerned accordingly uh tomorrow we have one speaker from california university dr bhagwati joshi and he requested me he requested me if you allow us allow me for 40 minutes uh, talk uh, then uh, and and he say that uh, as the conference start at 10 am and uh, he requested me uh, if you allow me at uh, 10 uh, 15 minutes before means uh, 9:45 uh, then maine unse kaha ki main participant se aur jo sabhi log hain unse puchunga ki 9:45 par wo log rejoin karenge kal ki nahi karenge aur accordingly main aapko iska inform karunga to you agree uh, i ask you questions you all agree at 9:45 uh, otherwise we have a session at 10 am it's better if you start at 9:45 and split among all okay sir <laughs> okay because it's a question so, of time we, um, the usa is um, uh, around 12 and half hour behind us and it will be midnight okay. by the time uh, he concludes his talk so it's better if we start 9:45 okay okay then uh, uh, the third day of the conference means tomorrow we have start uh, start at uh, but please submit it please okay i uh, okay okay sir i inform you all of the participants we have a whatsapp group and i inform you and uh, the re the rescheduled third day program i sent you the rescheduled third day program to all of you so uh, thank you thank you all of you thank you all the participants thank you all the speakers thank you so much thank you thank you very much thank you very much thank you very much sir thank you dear sir thank you very much sir